Welcome back, Flyers Nitty Gritty fans, to Getting Gritty With It with your host, Dreve Wallach, my partner in crime as always, Vasily Gianna Rocco's. Welcome back, my friend. I'm doing doing really good, Yuri. It's good to be on the show. Um, Flyers obviously eliminated from the playoffs, so there's a negative spin to this one just in terms of that. Uh, but there's a lot of positivity yeah, uh, to absolutely. focus on with this season and just with how the team uh, handled itself, really. Um, you know, beat a lot of top teams in the league. Uh, so that's something to build on going forward. Uh, and I'm excited just to kind of break down what happened to end the season here. Uh, and then obviously look at the future outlook. And we have an amazing guest uh, that everybody should already know. I'll hand it off to you, Yareev, just sure. uh, so you can introduce him here. Yeah, if you don't know him at this point, you'd be out of your goddamn mind. But uh, our, uh, you know, co-founder of Flyers Nitty Gritty, our dear friend, the one, the beloved Jamie Bascal, my friend. Welcome back on to the show. It's good to see you on the show. It's good to have you. We thought, and this was Vasily's point, and I love that he reached out to you. No better way to uh, to start the off season than to start with you. So, um, welcome back onto the show, Jamie. What's up, buddy? Hey, not too much. Aloha, aloha to everybody. It's like Hawaii over here. In, in any sense, uh, it's always <laughs> nice to come on the show and you know join. And you guys are rock stars, man. Uh, one day I'm going to come to each one of your homes and get your autograph. <laughs> okay, you do phenomenal work and <laughs> weekly. Weekly, I mean, weekly vacations, whatever it doesn't matter. There's a show that's you know pre done. I, I think that's kind of neat, you know, to put a swing on it, you know, to keep the uh, you know, ratings and stuff. You guys kick butt, so please like and subscribe to these two awesome people, Vasily and Yarif. Uh, I love them to death, they are great, and it, it's not just because of that, they really do uh, put out good content. Jamie, thank you so much, man. And uh, you definitely don't need to come to my house for an autograph. You can just come and hang out with me. Uh, I'll say Same that here, much. I'll <laughs> get you a flight over to Canada, both of you. No, not... You know what? That's coming, actually, hopefully in the fall. You know, I actually realized that we've been doing this for four and a half years, Jamie. And Shoot. Vasily, you've been here for what, two and a half already? Uh, Almost three. Three, three yeah. years already? Wow. Yeah, it's the third year covering the team, which Woo! is nuts nice to think about. Yeah, dude, time is fun. <laughs> I, dude, I'll Silly, never forget. I, I mean, dads, man. I'll I'll never forget when um you know we we left uh Philly Sports Network you and I yeah. Jamie and then you called me and you told me that Kelly came up with your wife Kelly came up with a uh name and you're like what about Flyers Nitty Gritty and I'm like I love that yeah. and that was it we like literally had one one option for a name we never even yeah, picked right? another yeah. name she nailed I'm it. Gonna be honest, it feels like 15 years ago I mean I know. You know, we've done a lot you know. Like yeah. you and Vasily, each week putting out. I mean, it's tough to do this show. It, it, like everybody, we can sit here and say, hey, let me do a podcast. It's a lot harder than what people think. There's research that's involved. There's programming that's involved. There's recording that's involved. There's, you know, honoring sponsors, you know, that's involved. It's just everything. You forget something. It's like, oh, why did I do that? Yeah, or, that's happened. And then you got to go back and re-edit. And then somebody pops up and you know, with a copyright thing or something, you know, or, or something of that nature. It's, yeah, it, it's a lot harder than what people think. Yeah, no, I mean, it, but it, I'll say this, it, I love it. And Vasily, I don't want to yeah. speak for you, but I assume you love it too, yeah. because we are not getting paid <laughs> from yeah. this. We're well, you doing should. This. I mean, listen, you stuck by ghost the entire time. And I want to let people know that, you know, this guy right here, your reef stuck by ghost the entire time. Vasily by everyone and Vasily, it's crazy. Vasily said that the Flyers would be on the playoff bubble, if not the cusp into the playoffs. This is what you guys said. And and I was on that show. We all said, it. you know, so yeah, I just exactly. want to let I just want to let the entire public know that when everyone says, Oh, no one, no one, that's a lie. Flyers nitty gritty said it. Yeah. I mean, we nailed dude, we nailed a bunch of stuff. Uh nailed the Sandheim thing. You know, I yeah. I I was even said it in the press room. I was like, that was one of the best trades Flyers didn't make. I was like, Tory Krug. Yeah. While I like him, well, I mean, another look undersized at the season, defenseman. Look at the season Krug had compared to Sandheim, right? So. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And he's a good defenseman. I'm not shitting on him, but I would rather keep Sandheim, especially um, a younger defenseman. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we're gonna get into stuff real quick. I can tell. So let me just do my usual spiel. Uh, Jamie already reminded you, but I'll 
remind you again, please like, subscribe. Uh, if you can share our stuff out, that's also amazing. Hit the notification bell for notifications. Follow us on iTunes and Spotify. Um, and uh, give us a rating there if you can. I saw some people already did give us a rating. Thank you all so much. That means so much to us. Uh, our ratings are fantastic. We're close to four and a half uh, out of five stars on uh, iTunes, and we're five out of five on Spotify. So that is amazing. Uh, I did see somebody, and I think it was removed. I didn't remove it, but somebody gave me or gave us. I say me because somebody gave us a, a one out of five star rating, and the comment was, "We get it. You're a product manager." So thank you for thank you for dropping our rating down for no reason. Just because of what I do for a living, <laughs> I guess. Um, but you know, whatever. Um, but it looks like it looks like iTunes might have removed it itself. I did not do that. Um, I don't. Oh, you can't. You can't do that anyway. But maybe. But they knew I was a product manager, so I don't know. Um, anyway, and uh, also shout out to our sponsor, Jim Steaks of Fourth and South. Jim Steaks will be reopening May first. I don't know if you know that, Jamie. But yeah. um okay. Yeah, so Jim Steaks finally reopening May first. And uh, gotta do a live podcast. Yeah, dude. We've been talking about that for a while. We we still gotta do that. Um and then a shout out to Summit Public Adjusters, 215-752-0560. Okay. Let's get into it. Um, we got a good amount of stuff to talk about. Um, we'll try to get to everything. We're not gonna dig like heavily deep into all the interviews that were today. I'm sure we'll reference some of them. Um, there's a lot to digest there, um, but next week we'll probably uh, reference a lot more of that information um, if we need to. Uh, so, you know, let's get right to it. So the Flyers fall short of the playoffs. They are in a shooting match with three other teams, the Washington Capitals, the Detroit Red Wings, the Pittsburgh Penguins. All of the teams needed to essentially win. Um, Detroit did their best, uh, scoring with three seconds left. They did eliminate the flyers. The penguins play tonight as we record. My bet is they probably would have won anyway. Um, but, uh, wouldn't have mattered because Washington did manage to beat the flyers in regulation. They did get that second goal on an empty net opportunity where the flyers pulled their goalie. Uh, where it didn't matter anymore. Uh, Tortorella did address that, said he found out after he already pulled the goalie. Um, but essentially, we gave them kind of a freebie. But you know what, Detroit? You screwed us. So we screwed you right back. That's all I have to say. <laughs> you screwed us by scoring three seconds left. So eat it. Um, having said that, it's really nice that the Penguins don't make it in. Um, and I would say Detroit would have been my first pick to go instead of the Flyers. But, you know, the Caps... And letting Ovi kind of run for another one could be worse. Um, yeah, so with that, I'll go to you guys for thoughts. Um, Jamie, we'll go to you first, so I'll let you uh, follow up afterwards. Jamie, what are your thoughts on the uh, on the Flyers' position here as they kind of finish the uh, the season? Honestly, I'm pretty positive. Uh, I hate to say that, and uh, people, you know, just call me uh, Mister Positive anyway. But I mean, how can you not be positive? Yes, there are some things that, you know, the Flyers can clean up or take away or wish they could take back or wish they could have done better to include John Tortorella down the stretch. I'm hoping he learns as a, you know, an older coach now. Uh, he still had, you know, to learn. This is probably one of his youngest hockey clubs, you know, in recent memory, you know, mm -hmm. that he's had. So, I mean, he did a wonderful job with the uh, youth. Yeah, there were some head scratchers, I'm not going to lie, for myself included in terms of lineups and why this person's in and why that person isn't in. But, you know, honestly, uh, we're not in a locker room like that. Uh, yeah, we can see practice and you go into the locker room, do some press, you know, stuff like that. But we don't know the actual ramifications that's actually going on inside. So did that person have where uh, something happened at home to where they were mentally exhausted and uh, too mentally exhausted for a game. And that's why player A was not in the game. And that's why player B got the game as opposed to player A. So uh, there's a lot of uh, different variables that happen. But, I mean, the Flyers, of course, have stuff they need to uh, work on. And that includes, to me, the biggest botch was the power play. If they had just had a half-decent power play, uh, maybe they would have had four to six more points, you know. And then I want to think back. A lot of people are trying to think back to games and stuff. 
I want to think back to one game in particular that was crazy. It was a game that didn't even happen. Remember that? What game am I talking about? The Pittsburgh Penguins game when Cutter Gauthier said, hey, when the news came out and the, uh, there was a trade cutter for Jamie Drysdale. You remember that? The Pittsburgh yeah, game? Yeah, yeah. No one can recall that game because no one watched it. Everyone was like two and two. Like, what happened? What happened? It was a game that never happened. But That's the a good point. just played like junk. And it, they played like junk for rightfully, uh, rightful reasons. I mean, they went through a lot of adversity. No one knew what the heck was going on, but it was a game that never happened. And then there was another game that never happened. It was the game following the uh, Carter Hart situation. That was a game that never happened. There's so much influx, you know, in terms of Carter Hart. So the Flyers did deal with a lot of stuff, you know, adversity-wise. Maybe not. They fought the injury bug, you know, in terms of the defense, you know, going down. And you heard today with Cam York, I'll I'll, I'll reference Cam York and uh, Travis Sanheim playing through tons of injuries and Jamie Drysdale and maybe yes and Jamie Drysdale as well probably all three should have played at some point you know at at the same time I mean uh (laughs) all three but they couldn't come out of the lineup because they were already beaten and battered on the back end and you can't just recall anybody because you only have a certain amount of recalls yeah you could do an emergency recall but the Phantoms one thing to keep in mind the Phantoms were also making a playoff push so you don't want to mess with that influx happening in Lehigh. So there was a lot of different variables that happened. So how can you not be positive about this season? I mean, us three right here, we're probably the rare three. And I say that because that had them even sniffing, possibly sniffing the playoffs, maybe falling short, but possibly even sniffing. And look where they ended up. So, yeah, I'm going to be honest. I'm not shocked by it. I'm not surprised they were a young team. Some players took the next step. Some players, you know, fell back. I mean, a a couple of those players were Cam Atkinson and Sean Couturier, rightfully so. Both missed an extended period of time. But other than that, yeah, I'm pretty positive that Danny Breer in the front office has a plan, and they acted on their plan. They, They promised that to the fans, and they proved it. You know, with trading Sean Walker, that they didn't have to trade Sean Walker at all, but they they elected to. Even with the injury rash, they still managed to get a first round pick for him when they were beaten and battered on the blue line. But so they made true to their promise, uh, and I think that that is a testament. So yeah, when the when the when the players today said there's belief, they should be believing because it was a heck of a year and it was a fun year. Yeah, well yeah, said. I was- that was really well said, Jamie. Just to jump off, um, I agree. I'm I'm pretty positive as well, just about the overall uh, season and how the Flyers performed this season. Most media pundits, as we said on this show many times, did not predict the Flyers to be anywhere close to the playoffs, let alone battling for a playoff spot uh, in the final game of the season. Um, us three, right? We did predict that they were going to be uh, right on the door, right on the bubble. And that's essentially how they performed for most of the season. Realistically, I mean, majority of the season, they were firmly in a playoff spot. And it really wasn't until uh, the eight game, you know, stretch, uh, winless stretch that they fell out and then kind of got unlucky just with some of the performances. Uh, but in terms of the Detroit game last night, I, th- I thought they really played a hard game. Uh really, you know, created some high danger chances and outchanced the Capitals 12 to 8 in that regard. Uh a big turning point for me obviously in that game specifically is the Joel Faraby goal in the first period not counting. Um it's a non-continuous play. Uh so that's the reason the goal essentially doesn't count upon review because it hits Faraby uh after the whistle is blown and then goes into the net. Uh, personally, I mean, my opinion on that is the NHL is probably one of the only leagues where their referees, uh, do not hold themselves accountable for the mistakes that they're making. Like other leagues probably would correct that call. The NHL does not, uh, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. And I think Scott Lawton made a comment that, you you know, when you're up one, nothing in a game, it could change the whole facet of the game and how you approach it. So it really could have had a different impact, but nonetheless, I mean, it's something that the Flyers really shouldn't look back and say, well, we got screwed by the refs because like you said, Detroit sent it to overtime nonetheless. Um, so that would have, you know, meant they wouldn't have made the playoffs anyway. But j- just in terms of the season in general, uh, they were competitive on a nightly basis, had success against some of the top teams in, in the NHL. They beat 13 top teams in the league this season. Um 
top 10 teams. So that just shows, right, that they were able to hang in there um, nightly with some of the best teams and some of the teams that are going to be contending for the Stanley Cup here. Um, when you look at just how they missed the playoffs and some of the key elements that might have, you know, led to them missing here. For me, the big the big one, and you already mentioned it, Jamie, I think everybody knows where I'm going here. Uh, it's the power play. Um, they have the last power play in the league. Um, there's probably so many games you can look back on where they lost, where they went 0 for 4, 0 for 5, 0 for 6 on the power play. And you think to yourself, hey, if we just get one goal at a certain point, maybe that's, you know, changes things up, switches momentum for us. And we end up getting a point and it's a different story, right? But that's uh, something that we've gone back to time and time again on this podcast. Special teams is a really crucial thing. The Flyers had kind of half of their special teams going and the other half not, right? Really good penalty kill all season, top 10 penalty kill but the power play i think really sunk them in a lot of crucial it's, spots and i don't mean to cut you off i just want to add it's even weirder when you think that they outscored every other team shorthanded yeah and then to not score and then to score the least you would the assume man up. like it's crazy no you would assume that with yeah like a man and up, they'd also be able to capitalize considering they're so proficient shorthanded when they're a man down. But um, I think for the power play, like there's going to have to be some change there, obviously. But really, the main thing for me is just their execution um, to telegraphed. And that really was a problem with a lot of their woes on the power play. It was easy for teams to predict what they were going to do and combat that. Um, so the power play really, you know, it's the worst in the NHL for this season. It's the worst of the NHL last season. It's the worst of the NHL the season before. It, the Flyers have had the worst power play for the last three seasons, which is an NHL record. Um, so I imagine Danny Briere and you know Keith Jones in the front office are going to be focused on finding some sort of way to improve there because I'm sure they realize as well that if their power play was even just 20th in the league, not even top 15, they're probably in a playoff spot right now as we speak. Um, and if you want to look at some other factors too, I mean, you have to point out Carter Hart, right? Uh, I losing think that's Carter, the biggest. Yeah, losing Carter Hart, I would say along with the power play are probably the two biggest ones for me. Um, why were the Flyers so successful early on in the season? They had stellar goaltending. And a reason for that is because they didn't have to over rely on Carter Hart. And they also didn't have to over rely on Sam Erson. When you removed Carter Hart from the situation, you removed a perfect 1A, 1B tandem that the Flyers had going. That was arguably for me, probably top 10 in the NHL in terms of goaltending across the league. Uh, so you remove Carter Hart and then you have to rely on a rookie in Erson to play, uh, you know, 51 games this season and his rookie year it's really a lot and i think that was not to say the beginning of the end for the flyers but the fact that they didn't have a reliable backup um to help urson it really degraded his play until he could get some rest right because you have a 25 and 30 game strat or 25 games and 30 day stretch and he just looked exhausted after that um but and an another thing to mention too is to go back to the power play, like the Flyers have no power play goals at all in the month of April. So that's kind of astonishing to yeah. me as yeah. well. Uh, yeah. And, and that's during the eight game stretch too, where, you know, maybe if they get some power play goals, uh, things might go their way in a different manner. But um, it, as a whole, my thing with this season is you had a lot of players really uh, take a lot of positive steps forward. A lot of young players specifically, like I, I would argue Owen Tippett took another step, a lot more consistency to his game. Look at Tyson Forster season, right? When was the last time you had a Flyers rookie potentially score, you know, 20 goals and be right up there in the Calder race. It's been a while. Um, so if you look at it that way, a lot of young guys taking positive steps, Cam York, one of them. So I think it's something to build on and the Flyers can uh, hold their heads high knowing that they you know, competed on a nightly basis, which was something that this organization had trouble with the past few seasons. Uh, and they competed with some of the best teams in the league. And then last point here, um, the Flyers rookies actually led the league in goals or lead the league in goals with 32. Uh, I think Chicago still has one game left, so it's possible they tie them. But I mean, for the Flyers in a rebuild to, to see your rookies lead the NHL in goal scored for a yeah. season, I think that's pretty successful. Yeah, and I think it's a point that is understated because people keep... I feel like the the perception of this team on the internet is not... It's not aligned with reality. 
Um, and, I, and that's not on a whole, but you see like the messages. You talk, talk about how we don't play young guys, how there's no talent here for young, you know, young players. You know, ever since we lost Cutter Gautier, you know, it's like all hope is done. And it's just like, I, I just think that's. And then they lead the league. Yeah, scorer. it's it's completely <laughs> illogical. Um, like Forrester is what, two years older than Cutter Gautier. It's not like, you know, people are pretending like these guys like, Everybody just converts players into veterans like so quickly. It's so funny. Um, the so one like, that's a great stat. That is a phenomenal. Yeah, stat. I think that needs to be heard a little more. To be honest with you, uh, yeah. that, that's something I didn't even know. Uh, not saying I'm the end all, but I'm just saying you know that's a great stat. Yeah, no, I totally. Yeah, agree. I'm gonna gonna bring it up in some articles this weekend, Jamie. We'll get there. You go. We get even more into it. <laughs> so, and I, I think the main takeaway there um, is something I heard Tortorella say, and I think this was before the game. Uh, even I think it's before they even played their last game, or was the the post or the 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 press conference after the game? I can't remember exactly. But the one thing I loved that Tortorella did is he literally said, "I'm proud of these guys." Yeah. You know, he hasn't really said. You can see his tone after they won those couple games, after even they went on the eight-game winless streak, his tone kind of changed where you realize that, like, kind of, it's kind of a show. Like, yeah. that that attitude of they didn't play hard enough, they didn't, like, that's not exactly how the guy feels inside. That's, like, what he's doing to try to trigger the right thing. Well, he's trying to take, um, sorry to cut you off, Reeve, but he's trying to take the attention off the team and put it on himself yep. in the media, right? Yep. Most likely, yeah. And there's kind of like this attitude, and then you saw that moment of realness where he's kind of like, look, the odds of us making the playoffs are pretty slim at this point. I'm not going to sit here and beat them up and try to drive them into the ground to maybe make the playoffs. Um, and he kind of just said how he actually feels. He's like, I'm really proud of this team. And I that's how I feel about it. Like, I am upset they didn't make the playoffs. I thought they had it. I'm not happy with the the winless streak. I thought it was uncharacteristic of the team. But, you know, a lot of people were talking about how, you know, did the sports lose the locker room? I'm like, I, I didn't see that. I didn't see a loss of the locker room. I saw a spiral. But, you know, when you talk about a coach losing a locker room, it's usually a long, drawn-out process. And then the way they kind of played rebounding from that 9-3 loss to Montreal – you know, you saw he didn't lose the locker room. They just spiraled, right? And he got them out of it. The team got themselves out of it. And there really is something real here. I mean, this team probably should have hit close to 100 points this year. If you if you still have Carter Hart, like everything you said, Vasily, still have Carter Hart, you, you add a little bit of power play success, top 25 even, you know, and they don't they don't get rid of Sean Walker. Right, which I understand, you know, very justifiable move. I mean, they probably are the third seed, maybe even competing for the second seed. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but like they really dealt with a lot of crazy on ice stuff this year. They just were incredibly resilient. So it makes it look like they weren't a big deal. But imagine most teams losing their top goaltender like that in an instant you wouldn't recover potentially typically. forever right or at least seemingly forever um it would set most franchises out of the playoffs and the flyers were still into the very last game um what do you guys think about that what do you think about towards his comments and jamie i don't know if you want to go first on that one yeah, you know honestly i agree with Vasily. it's a it's a deflection uh, a lot of it is deflection when you see him angered or something of that nature he drums up attention to place it on himself rather than his team, especially his rookie netminder, who he's run into the ground and he knows it. He just had no other choice, you know, to run with Samuel Urson. They he's really by far the best goalie. Even, yeah. if, even if they went out and got anti Bronta, he found himself on waivers. He didn't have the greatest season. He comes to Philadelphia. He struggles. Who are Who is Torts then going to lean on? He's going to have no other choice but to lean on Samuel Urson. So everyone could go back into time and think of what they would have done. Hey, at the trade deadline, I would have acted, I would have maybe added a vet, but see what some people fail to realize too, you have to be very, very careful with additions. You can't just bring in quale, you know, additions when the room is jiving because that person, if they're not jiving and say they're a cancer, 
you don't want to bring that, you know, said player into the locker room. It wouldn't even let Johansson in. Especially to that point. With a short span with only a month and a half left to go in the season. And you don't want to have influx and drama and, and stuff like that when the locker room is vibrant. You heard it today how fresh and vibrant people loved coming to the rink on a daily basis. Owen Tippett said it himself. Uh, Morgan Frost. They all said it. You know, uh, yeah, exactly. Every player that came forth was like, I'm really happy to be at the rink. Nick Sealer was the best with that. He was like, man, I, you know, it, that's one of his things. He's going to miss, you know, that part of, you know, the, the off season. Now they're going to miss each other and stuff. And, they actually love each other. Uh, we heard that today uh, from uh, one player. We love Lawton, each other. Lawton called them a family. And, and, I mean, those are strong words. So what the front office and Torts have done was now they built a foundation. Now they have a foundation. They have the building blocks. Now you just need to add the puzzle pieces to put in, in, in place, whether it's point A, point B, point C. Uh, let's try to improve here. Let's try to improve there. They're not going to make dramatic improvements next season. It's going to come. It's going to have to come over time. It's not like, hey, the power play goes from worst to first. Although it can, but let's be real here. Like just having a middle of the pack power play probably would have added six to eight points. So that's a point that Danny Briere is going to hone in on, and they will because many players have have leaned back on the power play, the power play, the power play. Even Rocky Thompson himself said at one point during the season, it was around like February or March, why did you put Denny Gurian off? Uh, it was in March, actually, mid-March, when he was uh, coaching the game. Yep. Why did you put Denny Gurian off, you know, in on the power play? He was like, the power play sucked. The power play has sucked. So why wouldn't I try him at least and see what could happen, you know? So he was quite honest. He knew it was bad. Now, could it be coaching? Sure. Could it be the set? We could get into all that later. But, um, yeah, I, I just feel like they, they really took that step this season. Now, hopefully, they can take the next step next season. So, let's do little by little because this is a rebuild and, uh, you know, stuff. So, I think that Torts is going to do that. I think he has a way of bringing, uniting the force. Uh, okay, guys. Uh, let let maybe not Stanley Cup is obviously the goal, but you know, let's make let's start with a a minor goal and then go from there because he's done that with Morgan Frost, right? Again, to steer deflection on himself as opposed to Morgan Frost, who may have been struggling at the, at the said time. Um, so he has a weird way of doing that stuff. Hey, this is what we're going to do. Let's make the playoffs and then go from there. Let's do this. Let's go from there. So now we're here. Go here. His expectations now next season are playoffs are bust for him. Uh, that that's what that's what it's going to be. But he is very good at uh, steering and deflecting attention. Who again, Samuel Orson was struggling bad. You know, bad. Whether it's the defense in front, yes, they were they were beat, beaten and battered. Whether it's the the unit as a whole, which they were, they were all struggling. I just want to add something to what you previously said. They just weren't getting the breaks that they were prior in the season. Like TK's hitting a post high, you know. Uh, remember uh, that the, the the Montreal game where they lost nine three. It was yeah. one to nothing at the end of the first. Well, they well, hit nothing three halfway two. through the middle. They yeah. hit three posts too, right a a in the first period alone. So those are the breaks that I'm talking about. You sink two of those goals, it's now two to one flyers headed into that second period. Would the wheels fall off the way they did? I don't know. They were a fragile bunch at that time. And I think that's why all those goals came in succession there. So I don't know. If it's two to one, that may have been a different outcome. Yeah, no, that's some great some great points, Jamie. I, I think what you mentioned as well, just with the locker room, especially this locker room being so close, um, it's just a great foundation for Breer and the staff to build on, um, especially too when you look at past teams and past teams weren't very close and how did those teams respond to resilience, right? Not as great, whereas this team that's so close really was a resilient bunch. I think that's a 
a huge fact because how many times have we heard this season uh, players say that they really want to play for each other? I really want to play for that guy next to me. Um, and that's a, you know, it's a hard mentality to bring pro like professional athletes together like that, right? Because these guys are all from different walks of life. They don't know each other uh, necessarily, but um, they're obviously at least a lot of the guys that the Flyers brought in here are character guys and able to work together. And I think it's a it's a really big part of uh, the team's success this season, relying on one one another, playing for one another. And I think that's probably a big part into why Torch said he's proud of the team. The fact that they, as a locker room, really bonded together and were playing for one another on a nightly basis. And I think for Tortorella, it's probably the resilience factor as well. Like how many things were thrown at this team throughout the year, whether it's, you know, losing to the worst team in the league to start the season that didn't win a game, the San Jose Sharks, they bounce back from that, right? Uh, they have a five game, uh, you know, winless streak going into the all-star break. Everybody thinks they're kind of toast. They bounce back from that, you know, losing their number one goalie. They bounce back from that trading their top prospect and having all this media hoopla around the team. They bounce back from that. Um, even the eight game winless streak here. Um, they also bounce back. I mean, it's a little bit too late, but they still do show the resilience and I think that's why Tortorella and, and even uh, all of us can look at it and say, hey, like it might have looked like this team quit just based on the results and the fact that they had this winless streak during the worst time of the season. But you saw that they bounced back and still continue to, the, to fight uh, till the end of the season. So I think the resilience is really the big part of why Tortorella probably mentions that he's proud of this group, despite the fact that they fall short and don't make the playoffs, uh, just because they were a team that played for each other all season. And even when things were going bad and when things did get bad in certain stretches, they were able to band together and fight back and show that resilience and get back to their structure, get back to their game. Ultimately, there was always a base level that this team got back to even when they would fall below it. So, yeah, no, I think, I think you guys are, I think all of this is just spot on. And I think there's so much positivity to come out of this season. And I think we're going to hear a lot more of that. As we roll into the off season, yeah. I don't think the the negativity that surrounds like the emotional moments that we just oh, had, yeah. I think that kind of will go away because people will look at this in retrospect. You, you want to add something, really Vasily? Yeah, yeah I was, was just really gonna upsetting. say that's really uh, upsetting. No, it is. It's upsetting they didn't make it, but I think obviously, no, no, no. I mean, upsetting to the fact of where the team was told that they were quitting. Oh yeah, he wants definitely. To be called a quitter. You know, like th that, 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 that upset me. Even if that upset me, I can only imagine the players and the coaches. My you know, Tortorella handled it. Yeah, I thought he handled it brilliantly. But I, I'm just saying, you know, like it's still upsetting, though. Uh, yeah, like, these guys are trying so hard, uh, trying to make the playoffs. Obviously, things are not going their way, kind of gripping their sticks a little bit, and then getting called yeah. a, a quitter, right, by some some media people and just fans in general. Obviously, didn't sit well in the room, but you could see that that probably maybe motivated them even more to bounce back, at least to end the season and end on a positive note, yeah. especially for, for a guy like Urson, too. I think that's a really important thing that he could end the season really positively with the shutout and just looking like he kind of regained uh, his progress prior form there but yeah I, I think for this season in general obviously it's disappointing that they don't make the playoffs and I think it would have been a really great learning experience uh for them to kind of get those playoff games for their younger players but they got to play in some playoff type atmosphere games down the stretch here so that's going to be valuable and it's definitely going to be a learning experience uh to the effect that every single game matters. And I think a lot of players showed that sentiment, uh, like Sean Couturier, Scott Lawton today in the exit interviews mentioned, even Travis Konechny that, you know, that random Tuesday night game in December for a lot of our young guys that maybe thought, Hey, like this isn't a make or break game. Well, every game, every game is a make or break game in the NHL. Every yep. point matters. I think that's really the learning experience that this team will take away from this, that, you know, that, that game in late December that you think, Oh, it's not going to matter. It could, could catch up to you down the line. I think as a young team, they will learn that lesson and learn that, hey, we need to be even more consistent than we were last season to kind yeah. of build upon it, right? I think I think you nailed it there, Vasily. That, that is, that, that, yeah, that's another great point. You know? Well, you learn that in the playoffs, which is why I wanted them to touch the playoffs. Everything ramps up. Everything is more difficult. And the consistency, not just from game to game, from shift to shift is like everything. You make one bad shift. You know, it was a, we, they got a taste of that with the, the Washington game, right? That was a really yeah. tightly played game. Um, and the playoffs, everything kind of resets, everything gets crazy, 
but like every mistake you made and the Flyers really didn't make a ton of mistakes yeah. in that game and neither did the Capitals. I thought they actually played defensively. They played very well the Capitals. Um that's where I thought Joel Farabee exceeded today was just what you just uh, touched on. Was it, he admitted that this time of year it was a, a lot different and that's a lot more you know, difficult. He learns from that, you know, yeah. and now he knows hey, maybe I got to do things a little differently. He did hone in on that today and I I thought that that was great admittance because, uh, I mean, we could surely see it. But, but you know, it, it was great to hear him. Hey, it was a different type of game, you know, the last 20 or so games. So that that was pretty cool to hear. Yeah. Hey, Vasily, you mentioned this earlier. Uh, we'll roll into this topic and I'll let you go through it. The Flyers record, you know, you you kind of touched on it earlier. But the Flyers record versus top 10 teams and then the bottom end teams – you know, we're talking about consistency, and this is something that the team will have to learn because their record against bad teams wasn't necessarily great when you compare it to how well they did against top teams. And it showed that, you know, they played up to their competition, but they also played down to their competition. And that's maybe the biggest criticism I had of them this season is that they're, and we saw it in this eight game winless streak. And yeah, that record would have been better without it. But there are times where they played down to their competition where, we all knew watching, you're better than this. And yeah. obviously, the first one that hit us was the loss against San Jose early in the season. And if you look at that even, and if they would have won that game, you know, you kind of you start looking back at all these absolutely winnable games, and they didn't grab it by the horns. Um, you know, it's all sure of what it could is, but uh, so I'll let you go through that. Yeah, sure. So essentially, the Flyers have thir 13 wins this season over top 10 teams. They also had 13 losses to bottom 10 teams. So to your point, Yareev, they were able to play up to really great competition, but at certain points, they also played down to lesser competition. And that speaks to a consistency issue in a sense where, you know, the, the Flyers, if they were able to beat these top 10 teams, 13 of them, they shouldn't probably have lost to as many bottom 10 teams as they did. So I'll go through the list here. And they were able to beat in terms of the top 10 teams. Teams. They beat the Rangers 4-1, beat the Stars 5-1, beat the Hurricanes 3-1, beat the Bruins 3-2, beat the Panthers 2-1, beat the Panthers 2-1 again, beat the Canucks 2-0, beat the Canucks 4-1, beat the Jets 2-0, beat the Jets 4-1, beat the Avalanche 5-2, beat the Oilers 4-1, beat the Maple Leafs 4-3. So that's 13 total wins against uh, those top 10 teams this season. And then the losses to the bottom 10 teams this year were a loss, loss to the Sharks 2-1, loss to the Blackhawks 5-1, loss to the the Ducks 7 4, lost twice to Columbus 1 6 2, once 3 2, lost twice to Montreal 1 9 3, once 4 3, lost twice to the Senators 1 5 2 once uh five three lost once to the flames um lost once to the kraken and then lost twice to the sabers once five two and another four two so i think that actually is kind of a tale of the flyer season in a sense where there's so many times this season where they showed us wow this team can really compete with these upper echelon teams in the league and even beat them uh on certain nights and outplay them actually because a lot of those wins they yeah a lot of those wins they dominate Right. And then the other half of the coin here is you see them kind of stoop down to the level of some of these uh, bottom 10 teams with 13 losses to them as well. So I think if the team here, obviously they're very young, but and it's something to learn from. But if there's just a little bit more consistency in some of those games against the bottom teams, they probably find themselves in a playoff spot right now. And that is the defining difference. Um, Jamie, Dude, those are great points. Those are phenomenal points. But see, that's why I was hoping that the gauntlet would have been 15 top 10 teams. <laughs> 15 games. No, you're true. You're right, teams. though, Jamie, it's because they play up. Teams. They play up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's it. So it, it's crazy. It, it's just an astounding stat. Uh, you know, it, it's – but you're right. Uh, in order for them to be considered, hey, okay, now we're a playoff team, Let's take the next step to being a contender. You have to be, you have to win those type of games. You have to win. And you you have to know that this time of year, even, even the, the teams that are out of it, this is their playoffs. They're trying to knock, you know, whether it be the Flyers, whether it be the Red Wings, whether it be the Penguins, whether it be the Islanders, whether it be the Capitals, they're trying to knock, take them down a peg. So this was their playoffs. Those are the tough teams that you got to play against, but they are the teams that, 
are there for a reason because they are a bad team to which, you know, the Flyers were a much better team than how they how they uh, played and portrayed. The one game I thought they played the best, they didn't get the result. And maybe that could have turned a corner for them was the Buffalo Sabres game where they lost two to one. I thought that that was a game the Flyers, you know, probably should have won. Uh, but the, it just didn't, you know, for whatever reason. I think the Sabres, I think, were held to, what, 18 or 19 shots, something like that on net, and they won the game 2-1. to one. It was just a, a, it was just one of those nights to where it, 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 it happens. Hockey is a weird sport. Well, uh, I say that. I love the sport of hockey, but it's weird. And yeah. it, those are the ebbs and flows of the yeah. sport of hockey. And no, Jamie, I, I I didn't mean to cut you off there. It just like it makes me think, like, you know, again, we know what the big missing piece is, a, a piece of this team is. Look, we if Matt, Matt Faye Mitchkov was here today, wow. great. But they need, outside of Travis Konechny, and at times, Owen Tippett, we'll see if he turns out to be that guy. And it looks like Forrester might be that guy in the future, too. But, like, they need a game breaker. Like, back in the day... You know, it was Claude Giroux, it was Jake Forcheck, and it was Wayne yeah. Simmons that would step up in those crazy moments a lot of yeah. times and set up a goal when it, the team desperately Players needed it. Players who could it. take a shift over, essentially. Let's say where the other team might not be going. Yes. And score for you, right? Yes. Don't forget one name that we're missing, Ville, Ville Lino. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he had a monster season back in the day, that's for sure. Playing with uh, GM Danny Briere. And, and, uh, right. they just and didn't yeah, and commentator they Scott Hartnell. Go to they didn't have that go to uh, you know player. That, that team was stacked though. That yeah. team was li- littered with talent. Well, uh, let's be honest here, right? But Coots was coming back from an injury. Coots used to be that guy. He yes. Right? So uh, I'm hoping. And that, in the beginning of the season, he was. And he was yes. And then you saw because he's missed so much time. Not making. I hate to make excuses for him, but it really, he missed a lot of time, like two, two and a half years yeah. a long time away, you know, from the rank. So I'm hoping that he comes back that way, you know, next season. And is that, is that I, clutch guy again, you know, I've never, and we talked about Jamie, you and I have talked about this on the phone. We talked about it on the podcast. There's always a cost to missing a significant amount of time with yeah. injury. Always, yeah. whether the player wants to admit it, yeah. whether they know it or not, it is the most yeah. consistent pattern is that guy will come back and not be the player he was. Kevin Hayes. We call yeah, it it's, Kevin Hayes, it's uh, hard to get you know, fully you know, accustomed. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to get fully accustomed when you miss so much time like Couturier yeah. did. I think, um, in particular, the speed of the game, like year by year, the game's continually getting faster and faster and faster. So to, to miss two years and then jump right back in, it's a big adjust. It's a really big adjustment. Um, and you know, unless you've played, it's, it's hard to understand that just how quick it could really be like from second to second, from shift to shift out there. I think the fact that he performed the way he did to start the season, that's really encouraging for me. Um, I think if you look at it and you, you look at Couturier, the, now that it'll have a full off season to train, um, and kind of know, okay, this is what I need to be prepared for, for a full rigorous 82 game season. I think that'll benefit him. Definitely. Yeah. But the sport is getting younger too. It's getting younger, not older. Yeah, you know, definitely. So like now, to to your point, facility, you have all these young guys, you know, that are skating their butts off, the, like the speed of the wind, you know. And we could practice all we want. At, at practice? We talking about practice, you know? Uh, but uh, you know, but you can practice all you want and train all you want, but it's nothing like. And, and Cam Atkinson said that the best, uh, to where it's nothing like you know game action, whether it's preseason or. You know some sort of competition. Yeah. That's you why you can't I, simulate that, right? Yeah, exactly. That's why I sort of liked uh, Cam Atkinson. He was a uh, one biggie. He was a very big proponent, and I saw him, and everyone saw him. You know, in the scrimmages, you know, in the off season, you know that uh, they try to formulate because they want that edge of competition to try to stay fresh. Uh, in, in uh, you know, for the you know the grueling eighty two game rigors of the season. Yeah, and I thought that that was cool, Bobby Brink. To realize that today, hey, I need to get bigger and stronger. My, I need to work on my conditioning, you know, this year a lot more than I ever did because he is a smaller guy, you know. And if if you want to be something in this league, you know, as a smaller guy, what's one way to stay in the league? You got to bulk up, whether that's adding muscle, you know, some sort of good fat because there are some good fats, not all bad, you know, it's not all bad fats, you know, whatever. But Whatever he's got to do, because he has the awareness, he has the keenness. Uh, it, you know, I have big hoops for uh, Bobby Brink. You yeah. know, but um, yeah, it was good for him to realize that too. 
Yeah, no, I th- I think the team overall will be better prepared next season. I like you you said it perfectly. I think expectations will be raised next year. I think the team will the GMs again. We haven't heard their closing comments yet, and we haven't seen what's going to happen over the off season. My my, I would imagine that the team is going to try to get better. Uh, they're not going to do anything drastic, most likely. Um, they might bring in one, you know, top player at some point, but it, th- this is the time where you can start transitioning. You still have more cap stuff you got to clean up, but it's really about what the players do in the off season and build upon what they have today. Um, and we saw what they were able able to do from the prior season to this season. There is more room for growth here, and they should all be realizing that. Uh, and even the you know the two of the veterans that struggled. They need to get back to where they were. They might not need to grow, but they need to get back to their game, which they can definitely do. Um, I want to bring up a, a tweet here by Jay Fresh. Um, and this was, he was just doing these breakdowns of errors of uh, scoring. And he has this tweet here uh, about, you know, goal, essentially their success, their record overall, but their goal differential. Um, the Flyers' goal differential over since 2020 in the retool era uh, is a minus 66. Now, this year we saw, I'm sorry, minus 166, much worse than I even said. Even um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so we saw the Flyers actually with a, a plus in that category until kind of the last 30% of the season where the defense started going out the window. And we Taught, this is why I believe Carter Hart is actually the biggest element, not even the power play. That like losing that edge that they had with the two good goalies, with the the way the team was playing defensively, losing Sean Walker, having all those injuries. I think that's where they kind of lost themselves because that's how they were winning games. And you looked at that record, yeah. Vasily, that you pointed out. They beat those really good teams by limiting those teams' opportunities. Like they they really hamper yeah. down the way they even and, and then the flyers capitals. in turn were opportunistic on their chances in this yes. game. yeah they were a counter-attack team it's you see it with the penalty kill that's the type of way that they needed to win you look at that era and this is you know jamie brought up chain goss's bear it's like the reason i didn't want to trade goss's bear is because i was looking at offensive defenseman where his role was to transition from defense to offense and that's what he was doing and then they, everybody was blaming him for, for the team's bad defense, where the team just was bad at defense overall as a group. And I think that's what Tortorella has fixed the most. And to put the whole category as a retool era, it's not the retool era, it's the torts era. And I guarantee if you look at that, uh, that minus, it's not going to be heading towards some kind of... Uh, abysmal number i think it's going to start heading in the right direction even though they were i think it was minus 24 in the end uh they were a plus until that spiral and then they had that nine game they gave up nine goals they just kept giving up a bunch of goals in this short amount of span um through the gauntlet and then through that losing spree uh but prior to that they weren't really that team they were a team that kind of locked you down defensively and i think that's what they really need to get back to and what they need to do to be successful is be a team that plays damn good defensively. And then when you bring in that Mitchkov and you bring in that, uh, the, you know, whatever guy that they bring in the future, whoever they draft, even if it's Denver Barkey who surpasses expectation, or Oliver Bonk, whatever it is that comes in here or, or a trade that's made, you know, you add that, those more offensive guys into a team that knows how to shut teams down. That's how you win championships, in my opinion, is you build that culture. Jamie, yeah, go, so- go ahead. Yeah, so like, uh, you know, to hone in on the uh, power play, it looked like uh, the puck at, at times was like a hot potato. They didn't have that. Like you just honed in on uh, Borachek, you know, and Claude Giroux and stuff like that. Remember, they they were the commanders of the ship, you know, for, you know, in terms of the power play. They didn't have – they don't have those guys that, that want the puck like that. They want the puck on their stick at, at the – at that, you know, those key moments. And I hope that – you know, that the players that are here next season realize, hey, you know what, it's time for me to step up and take a man, you know, like G, like Voracek, because Voracek could pass with the best of them. But when he got the wheels rolling, he was one of the toughest players to move off the puck. Come take the puck from me, especially being a man down. I'll find the open man. That's how good he was. He wanted the puck on his stick. Claude Giroux wanted the puck on his stick. The Flyers didn't really have that. They go, you know, back and forth on the perimeter. Everyone just seemed 
I'm not saying hesitant, but no one really wanted to command ownership. Yes, that the puck is mine. And I think that that is something that Morgan Frost can be very good at. And I think he talked about that, you know, at his uh, exit interview today. But, mm-hmm. you know, getting back to, to, not, to try to stay on track in terms of goal differential, that's crazy. Uh, it's absolutely insane. But, yeah, you make a great point about uh, Carter Hart. I mean, John Tortorella was utilizing both goaltenders appropriately. Mm-hmm. Actually, he had the fan base up in arms at one point saying, I don't understand why Carter Hart can't play more, you know, as opposed to, you know, playing Samuel Urson. Because at that time, you remember Urson was going back and forth. He wasn't. But then he found his niche. After like the first month and a half of the season, he really became a good backup netminder. He found his niche. Hey, I'm not going to – he got it in his head, I think, and still – and it takes time from him playing all the time and wanting to play, you know, with the Phantoms and stuff. Then he comes. He's not that guy here. Now he's got to take different ownership and become a backup netminder to where you're not playing on a daily basis. So he had went through the ebbs and flows of the first month and a half of this season. His numbers weren't too – his numbers weren't terrible, but they weren't good either. They were like mediocre average – tilting below average a little bit for a backup netminder, but then he found his niche and he got on a roll. And so did, you know, Carter Hart was phenomenal. I thought, you know, up until he was, you know, uh, taken away from the team. So, yeah, I think that that was the key moment there was uh, Sam Morrison was like, went through the ebbs and flows of finally becoming a good backup netminder to say, hey, you know what? You're going to be the guy now. You're How the about- starter now, rookie. Here Good you go. You. You know what I mean? So now he's got to go through more ebbs and flows. And so the goal differential, which was tilting and getting down, you know, uh, maybe not 166. Maybe they could have finished at 126, you know, this season, you know, minus 126, you know, because they allowed 40 more. Man, that's a crazy number. I just That shows you how bad the goaltending has been. Uh, you know, for, for, for all those years, you know, uh, really, I mean, they finally have a netminder in, in Carter Hart. And now, you know, now he's gone. Well, those and numbers he, were under Carter Hart. I think I, I, I'm sorry to cut you off, Jamie, but I think it stems to the team just didn't know how to play defense as a, as a unit. Yeah, well, the structure Tortorella put in place, right? Like, remember all those backdoor goals that Carter Hart used to give up all the time? Think that, about those Elaine Vigneault era teams. That yeah, was a yeah. trend of theirs, right? Leaving the goalies out to dry, playing really bad defensively. Um, I thought that this was his best season. Uh, you know, when before he got taken, before yeah, he was taken away very calm, the very common net, oh, man, great it was numbers. Like a different Carter Hart. It was like he was making the saves that he didn't prior. In the well, previous three to four seasons, Jamie, he's yeah. a young goalie, right? He's coming, he's coming into his prime, essentially. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. really, that's really unfortunate, right? Like, I mean, yeah. obviously, what happened yeah. to him? There's legal repercussions, things like that. Uh, but just from like an on, on ice hockey perspective, like he was coming into his prime as a goaltender. Like people have to remember, he's only 25. He started very very young uh in the league uh most goalies aren't going to be starting at that age right so you have to look at it that way like he was just reaching his prime as a 25 year old probably when most goalies don't even come into the league until 25 uh which is crazy but i think you're spot on Yurive. like if you look at it um and you just look at what happened with the team and the goal differential uh the fact that you aren't able to to run with that starter kind of 1b setup that you had uh with urson with hart it really does detriment the flyers here because once you go into guys like you can't rely on like sandstrom like a peterson who just couldn't really give him a solid start then you have to run your goaltender into the ground that's kind of where things uh start to spiral a bit for the flyers that and just the defensive the defensive woes in terms of you know you subtract sean walker and then nick sealer getting injured simultaneously i think those two things plus the goaltending probably are the are the big factors for sure yeah and drysdale out for a considerable amount of time when he was playing well and you saw it took toll pretty much the end of the season to even get him back to form just because he's been injured all year long, as we know from his exit in- interview. Um, you know, it's really going to be interesting to see how the Flyers move forward this all season in terms of the goaltending situation. Do they bring in that veteran netminder just in case Ivan Fedotov or Alexei Kolosov, you know, aren't ready, which it's a tough position to play. 
and they have to get adjusted to the North American ice. And we saw Ivan Fedotov, you know, at times struggle. And I, I didn't really make a big deal out of it. And I know you guys didn't either. And really, the fans were very nice about Ivan, you know, as well. And not people really, understood that he just got yeah, here. Exactly. It was very understanding. It was cool to see the fans not berate him and, you know, stuff and understand, you know, the situation. It looks like the fans really bought into this team and really – they, they've always been a family, but they were just, you know, so it was cool to see the fans. I think they they should get a shout out for how they acted, you know, and stuff That's like that. Point. Holding, you know, like understanding, hey, this is Ivan Fedotov just got here. You know, I paid big money and yes, he's getting shellacked. But, you know, I understand it's the ebbs and flows. I think that they were very patient and did very well this year, the fans. I, I think they deserve a lot of kudos, but. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. That That is the biggest part to me of the offseason. It's to see uh, everyone else is like honing in on, uh, you know, uh, uh, possibly a number two center, which is understandable. Uh, at the very least, a number three center, which is understandable. But I'm honing in on uh, what they do at the, at the goaltending position because that's going to be an interesting part for me. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think – I think there's an argument to be made uh, both ways to either bring in a veteran or to just be like, hey, we're a rebuilding team. We'll call up Kolosov if we have to. I just don't think that they're going to rely on Peterson going into next season. So yeah, I wouldn't yeah. be shocked if they do bring in another veteran. Um, but th- we don't know. We don't know their opinion on Kolosov. So, you know, they might be like, no, Kolsov is good. We just threw him in a bad situation. Or they're going to be like, well, Kolsov might not be ready. Because I doubt they're going to want to roll into the season again next year being like, it's either Airson or we're screwed, right? Airson, Fedotov, yeah. Yeah. Kolsov, exactly. That's what I mean. That That's what I mean. It's, so what do you do? Do you add that veteran net miner? I, and I would, personally. I would. about blocking the youth? It's a I great would, point. It's a great injuries. point to make. I, I think personally, I mean, if there's a guy to target, maybe a, a Jake Allen uh, obviously got traded uh, from Montreal to New Jersey. And he's been a really good, like veteran, solid net minder for years at this point. I don't know what type of money that's going to take or how much money the Flyers are really going to want to put into goaltending. But that's also you, part of the problem. You right? have to you have to look into it now. You're going to have Carter Hart coming off the books. They're not going to qualify him or resign him. So that's your money right there. Urson's not making a lot. Uh, neither is Fedotov, most likely when they resign him. So really, they might be able to spend uh, and add another go- a third goaltending option just to kind of shore it up. I have a hunch that they might not. I think I think we see them go with Urson and Fedotov. Reason being, we have Kolosov also as well in the AHL. So let's say Fedotov falls flat. They probably try to swap Kolosov in there and see what yeah. happens. Um, I do think like, if you look at Fedotov and Kolosov, the main thing for these guys as a goalie, uh, it's just going to be the angles. Uh, yeah. That's the hardest adjustment. That's the hardest thing to really account for. Your angles as a goaltender in a new arena, new sight lines, uh, new ice surface, that's really, really difficult to get adjusted to. And it's going to take probably three to four months for both of those guys. And the main thing too is not even just the angles, but at certain angles and depending on where you're taking the shot or or trying to cut the angle off and where the puck hits you, you're playing your rebounds a lot differently Um you know, on on the um, international ice surface versus the North American ice surface. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot to be said there, but I think it could go either way. I think really it might depend on what some of these veteran goaltenders are going to be looking for in the UFA market, uh, just because the cap's going up. So they're going to probably want would, potentially more than you would expect. So Well, if you do cleanup duty and free agency and wait to see what rolls out, you might be able to get a discount on one of those guys, yeah. but it's probably not going to be Jake Allen, right? He'll, he'll probably be one of the... He'll be the top of the... Of the yeah, and I think the Anthony Stolar's p- potential as far as backup goalies go, um, they'll probably be the top of the crop there, like you said. You think he resigns or no? Who, Stoli? I yeah. think he'll resign with Florida. It depends. But if, hey, you got to look at it this way. He's, what, 27, 28 years old? He's probably thinking maybe a bad team in the league will give me a chance to be a starting goalie with the way he's played this season. So. Who knows, right? That, that's why I say it's like I could argue either direction at this point, and I think the Flyers, and to your point, I don't think it's going to be their top priority. That might upset people, but I don't think that going out and getting a goaltender is going to be their top priority just because they have four goaltenders locked yeah. up. If they couldn't have brought Fedotov over, I think it definitely would have been, yes. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, and I don't see them buying out Peterson. If they buy out Peterson, then it's a definite. Um, yeah. no, but I, I, I don't yeah. see it. I don't I, see them I, wanting I do to hold. I do see a buyout. For but Peterson? No, no, no. No, no, not for Peterson, for, for another player. Oh, okay. All right, well, maybe we'll we'll save that towards the end of this, and we can talk about that. Uh, let's uh, let's get into the next topic, and then uh, we'll we'll do a quick talking break for me, and then we'll get into the second half of the show. So, Flyers did hand out awards uh, before the final game, uh, and I'll read them out here. So, Travis Konechny got the Bobby Clark Award. The trophy goes to the uh, MVP, um, most points in the Toyota Cup. Uh, and then they gave Travis Sanheim the Barry Ashby team's best defenseman. Cam York got the Pelly Lindbergh for the most improved. Nick Sealer got the Yannick Dupree, the Class Guy Award for character, dignity, respect off the ice. They gave Sam Erson uh, the Gene Hart Memorial Award uh, for most heart uh, of the team. Uh, and then they also gave Scott Lawton the community award. Uh, and then on top of that, Lawton was also nominated for the King Clancy award, uh, throughout the NHL as, as well. So, uh, just my quick thoughts. Um, I think all of these are completely appropriate. That's how I saw things essentially play out this year. I maybe could have gone with Couturier over Nick Sealer just because of coming back from his injury, but then you can make the case for Atkinson too. And I think Nick Sealer really is that guy. So I think it makes sense completely. Um, and then giving Sam Harrison, you know, the Gene Hart, that is completely appropriate. I mean, the guy showed a ton of heart this year. He obviously was put in a bad position for a rookie um, and excelled, especially at, excelled at times, uh, looked fantastic, you know, struggled at times, but also looked fantastic at times. Um, and I think he definitely deserves that. Um, the tra Travis Sanheim getting best defenseman makes complete sense to me. I think he was the team's best defenseman from beginning to the end of the season. You can make the case for Cam York, who wasn't as good in the beginning of the season as he was at the end. Um, but that's why he gets the most improved. So I think all of these are very, very appropriate. Um, uh, Vasily, I'll let you go first on this one. Um, what are your thoughts on the awards? Yeah, I can't really disagree with any of them. I mean, connect is a no brainer. Most points yeah. on the team. Of course, he's going to get the MVP. I just imagine like he played so well with Couturier when Couturier was playing kind of at that first line center level for the first 40 games. Imagine how, you know, many points he would have put up if Katuri was going like that all season, right? So I think that's something to look to for the future. Um, best defenseman makes a ton of sense at Sanheim. I think you could have went with York as well, potentially. But I, I just think Sanheim and the way he played to start the season kind of gave him the edge there. Um, he's really on another level to, to begin in terms of points and even defensive prowess. Um, Nick Sealer makes a ton of sense. Like, think about character. Uh, look at the guy and the way he blocks shots on the ice, right? That's a character player and a character guy for this team. It makes, you know, a ton of sense to pick him there. Um, Urson as well, just getting thrown in that situation as a rookie. Um, I don't really think there's anybody else that you could have uh, put in that position, maybe a Couturier or like an Atkinson, just because they come back um, and have such an impact on the locker room and the team as a whole. Um, and then Lawton um, getting the King Clancy, uh, that's, really great for the flyers and just for him in general uh because you know he's had such an impact on the team i think the last few years specifically becoming more of a pronounced uh, pronounced leader within the locker room so i think it's good for him to get recognized how about you jamie what do you think about the awards here yeah yeah i thought i thought they were all very appropriate uh uh did an article on that uh almost nailed everyone i did not have nick sewer uh winning uh what the yannick capri i had uh I actually had Noah Cates there because uh, Noah Cates, uh, unbeknown to a lot of people, uh, Noah Cates does a lot in the uh, community. He actually invited members of youth hockey, local youth hockey teams. He had a certain amount at each game this season. He paid oh, for wow. tickets. Oh, wow. That's awesome. And he would bring them that. into the locker rooms after the game and have a meet and greet with him. So I thought that that was pretty cool. I love so Noah I gained. That, that's why I, I, I gave Noah Case. I was like, hey, you know what? You know, somebody different, somebody fresh. But Nick Sewer is more than deserving of such as well. So he just does so much, you know, for the locker room on and off the ice and uh, in the community as well. So, but, yeah, I thought all the choices were absolutely correct. Now, the one question I had to propose, and this is kind of a monkey wrench, and because I agree with both of you, uh, no shockers, um, TK. 
MVP award, right? If he doesn't eclipse the 30 goal mark, does Samuel Erson then move up to the uh, take the uh, Bobby Clark uh, trophy there? I think there's a chance, but because of the Toyota Cup thing, you know, because he won most stars in a game, I think it would have been TK regardless. He, if he wasn't injured, you know, I think he would have hit. It would have been close to forty if he didn't have those injuries and the slowdown, yeah. um, and the fact that you know this team put up scoring without a even close to adequate power play. Yeah. I don't know. I think Arison played really well, but um, he also had some down periods. Mm-hmm. I think there's a couple factors. I mean, you can look at Konechny too and say, okay, he got hurt, and that was when he came back from that injury. We're not really sure what it was. Um, he kind of had a bit of a down period and was a little slow. And then that eight game stretch, the winless streak, he wasn't producing that much as well. And I guess you could look at the whole team and say that for uh, an offensive standpoint. Um, but to your point, Jamie, I mean, if Konecki doesn't hit that 30 goal mark, I think, and somehow the Flyers got into the playoffs with kind of Urson backstopping them here, I think it would have been Urson. Uh, most likely, like if they would have, let's say, gone to this final game and were already firmly in a playoff spot um, and Konecki didn't hit that 30 goal mark. I mean, obviously woulda, coulda, shoulda's here, but I think Urson def- definitely could have uh, definitely could have gotten that award uh, as well. But I think Konecki's a no-brainer just due to the fact uh, he produced the most points on the team. And just because when really, if you look at, when was this team rolling? When when this team was playing well, he was typically their best player and typically yeah. producing and at the forefront of it. So yeah, I think outside of Sanheim, he was the most consistent player on the team. I think yeah. Sanheim people, I don't think they realized how consistently good Travis Sanheim was this year. He had only at one point really struggled. Yeah. Um, and outside of that, he was the backbone of the defense. Well, just think about all the breakdowns that he would have in years past that essentially essentially oh, he, eliminated from his game this season, right? Just look at that alone. So, And funny how he did that at 27 years old and not oh, yeah. 22, 23. Yeah. Wow, yeah, what a surprise. Always, he's always been a phenomenal skating defenseman, even, yeah. even with his blunders like falling or whatever or, you know, whatever. But skating defensemen don't grow on trees. And that was one thing, you know, that people wanted. Hey, let's get rid of Sandheim. Let's get rid. We got to get out from underneath that contract. Okay. Where would this team have been this season without him? Oh man, that's what I mean. Who would have logged those minutes? You couldn't rely on Cam York coming into the season because no one knew what Cam York was going to be. You couldn't rely on Nick Sealer because he he's first off he's not that guy no more to play twenty five to thirty minutes a night. Uh, you uh, you couldn't rely on Sean Walker to do much because. You know, he he was just coming off a so so you know you know campaign. I mean, really, there was no one. Rasmus Ristolainen, uh, who tends to have that one fluke injury uh, each year or whatever, um, you know, or something. Maybe not a fluke injury, but you know what I mean. So you can't necessarily rely on him. Who the heck could you have relied on? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So when when Yurif honestly says. That was the best trade that did not happen. That was the absolute best trade that never happened in Flyers history. Yeah. Thank God for Tory Krug. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. He helped us out. That's why I talk about like letting things play out as they should. Uh, and sometimes things look bad to you, but you know, you're not entirely sure. And I'm going to make a bold statement right now, and it's way too early to make this statement, but <laughs> most improved on this team next year will go to Jamie Drysdale. Oh, uh, I like that. That's a, that's a good prediction. I'm not even concerned. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know why some people are concerned, but it is what it is. Well, I mean, they're watching an injured player, but but it's okay. Uh, you know, he's going to have to prove people wrong, and I agree with you. He's so young; it's a tough position to play. And when Torts said earlier in the season, when, you know, when they acquired Jamie Drysdale, you know, we don't even know what he is. He hasn't played enough games. That's what he's talking about. He's always in him. He he's banged up, you know, and he was hurt all year. He said. You know, uh, today. So, but yeah, I, I agree with you. Hopefully, hopefully he doesn't get that surgery. Hopefully he doesn't need surgery like he said he might. Yeah, they might need some cleanup surgery. Um, I, I think uh, either way, I expect a big season from him. Again, to come over to a new team, he clearly was coming from a team that was not run well. Good luck, Cutter Gautier. Um, You know, and that was rushing an 18-year-old defenseman in the league. You don't do that. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's so rare that that works out. 
um, to bring in a guy draft plus one year and to put him in the NHL, even if he's an offensive defenseman, you you stick to your better instinct and you allow him to develop. They, he got no development time. And you look at what Shaw did with York and Sealer, who the reason I think he did, shouldn't get most improved is because he played this way last year as well. Um, and like you look at what Shaw was able to do with this defense. I just give him time with Jamie Drysdale, a healthy Jamie Drysdale. And I have a feeling we're going to be speaking very differently about Jamie Drysdale next year. A lot of people are low on him. And I saw people, and I don't know if this is a lot, but I saw people already lamenting Cutter Gauthier. And now they're upset. We got Jamie. I, I would, I would really hold your horses on that. And I said that when we traded for him, do not judge this player off of the sample size that you're getting right now, because yeah. that is not going to be the player that you're going to be watching. In the well, future. I, I think just to, to kind of end off on Drysdale here, you're even, like, if you look at defensemen and their typical trajectory in the NHL, unless you're, you know, a uh, once in a lifetime type defenseman like a Kale McCarr who's coming in at 18, lighting the world on fire, most defensemen don't come in their, you know, first couple seasons and really produce to that manner. Like, leave and look at a Cam York, right? He came in, he struggled, he had to get sent back down to the AHL to the Phantoms and look at his play this season, right? After kind of taking his lumps, uh, playing down in the minors, uh, kind of learning uh, and learning the defensive game a little more. And then look at, look how he played this season. So I think it's similar with, with Drysdale in the sense that it's there's a lot for him to learn, but I think under the tutelage of this coaching staff and how uh, you know they teach the defensive game, that's really what he needs to learn. I think offensively, the skills and the talent's already there. You can kind of just let him run. It's more of the defensive aspects they're going to focus on. And he's still a very, very young defenseman. Like defensemen in the NHL, like a Sandhawk, usually don't come into their primes and play at their best until a 25, 26, 27. So there's a lot of time with Drysdale. And I, I think he, you have to be patient with a player like him and his skill set. Yeah, and even the greats in the league, like not all of them are Nicholas Lidstrom that comes in the league and dominates or Kale yeah. McCarr. N N Victor Hedman struggled mightily coming into the NHL. He's arguably the best defenseman in the NHL. You know, there you can... Uh, Duncan Keith, we brought him up several times. John Carlson. He, John Carlson. Uh, Kimo Timonen. There are plenty of examples of guys you need to let them bake. And I think in our system, one that now revolves around Jamie's game, I think will improve here. Um, I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. I think the skill set is out of this world. So I, it's above Goss's Bear. And Goss's Bear has an immense skill set, and he was excellent here offensively and people want to downplay that but you can look at his numbers they were there he had a couple down years when the team had a down year he had a down year but if you really look at it when the team played well his numbers excelled and i expect that from jamie too and i think he can definitely be a 60 point defenseman in this league maybe even above that um if he really gets going and quinn hughes is another name of a guy who you know i we brought this up that bruce boudreau was they were talking about trying to convert him into a winger uh, at the N at the yeah, center at the NHL <laughs> level, and now look at him today. It's just this is an offensive defenseman. Like you need to allow the coaching staff to kind of take over, and this is why I I really hate that they rushed him into the NHL. But maybe it'll work out in the long run for us because <clears throat> I think it will. But he he uh, he speaks like a veteran. Uh, like he he took ownership of the power play from himself today. Yeah, yeah, he, very composed. He, or, or whatever he was like no i uh, he was like honestly i should have been better on the power play yeah <laughs> like you know there's no reason for me not to be you I, know on the power play i the, i thought that that was kind of cool yeah you know? no i, I think that oh he sorry no sorry jamie didn't mean to cut no, you you're off there good. go ahead um I, yeah with the power play thing <clears throat> look i like rocky thompson i think he he did a 5 and 5 i think he did a very good job um i'm not sitting here shitting on him i don't necessarily think he should be fired like i don't look at him that way but i definitely blame the power play on him i i observed this power play all season long i hated the the system he was in, putting in place i believe that the lack of ownership over anybody uh on the power play comes down to the lack of leadership from the co <clears throat> coaching there and putting the i talk about it all the time like i don't you don't need a ton of options on the power play that's not real i people can argue with me about it but the best teams on the power play, they keep the power play really simple. And we did not do that. Like we overcomplicated the power play considerably. And I yeah. believe that. 
And it and I think something simple, you want to improve the power play, find a power play specialist that doesn't play on the ice that can come here and put a system in place to work on the power play specifically. If you want to keep Rocky Thompson, find someone to help him. They definitely didn't have the right solution internally. And they can say, yeah, the power play was bad. It got worse under Rocky Thompson. It's the worst I've ever seen it. It's the it's, worst in NHL history, literally. Yeah. For the last three seasons. So. And again, that's not all his fault. That's why I don't believe in like firing the guy. I don't think he did a job worthy of being fired, but there's undeniable that they did not put the right system in place uh, to be successful in the power play. I didn't see it. I didn't see it all season long. And I look at the power play, and this is the same thing I said about Nick Sirianni for the Eagles. I'm not a football guy. The reason I thought Sirianni should have been let go is because at countless times we were watching them play and going, why would you do that? That's how I felt watching the power play. It wasn't like, oh, they just don't have the talent or they don't have a shooter. It's like, I don't want to hear that. They have three guys who can light up the puck. Okay, it, it, They have enough talent on this power play to be 20th in the league. They Great. are not putting the right process in place to execute. Brad Shaw did not have the best defenseman in the NHL, yet he had this team as the number one penalty kill at one point in the league. Like, you don't need the best assets to play a solid system. The solid system was not there on the power play. I don't buy the excuse of, you know, of the players on the ice. They'll say it was them. It's partially them, but it's partially them to not make them top 10, top 15. But to be adequate... That that falls on coaching, in my opinion, and I think they fell short in coaching department in on the power play, and it's noticeable. And I think they have to bring in a specialist. And I even brought up like bringing Craig Berube. You're friends with him, Jones. Like bring him in here. Can he observe this power play and try to get it to be somewhat reasonable? Because um, I didn't I didn't see that at all uh, this year. Get Joe Mullen back, <laughs> uh, dude. If only, dude. Did we clone him? That's why I like uh, Oscar Eklund. Uh, I think he's going to play an integral part with the uh, man advantage because he's really tough to move in front of the net next year. I think yeah. uh, he'll be on the man advantage, whether it's uh, PP, maybe PP2, but, uh, you know, I think he should be on PP1 with his size. That's a good well, point, Jamie, because, I mean, screening a goalie is a crucial thing, right? If the, if yeah. the goalie can't see the puck, usually they're not going to save it. So, And they don't really have anybody who does that. My whole thing is I'm always – hesitant with european players in their transition over here and when they're in their mid-20s he could blow us away you know i'm open to that but i just i wouldn't bank on it yeah we'll have to see right training camp what he looks like yeah yeah i'm excited to see what he looks like he's swedish player i love swedes um they tend to surprise you on how good they are um all right real quick just want to remind everybody please like and subscribe uh hit the notification bell for notifications um, follow us on iTunes and Spotify. Give us a rating there as well. It's a humongous help to us. All right, we're going to transition kind of to other players, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, talk a little bit about the draft. Uh, so, first bit of news that we didn't have since the last episode. So, Hunter McDonald did end up getting his ELC. Uh, he came in initially as a tryout, um, which was a little confusing, but I'm sure there was some technical reason they did that. But they did give him the LC. I guess they got the look they needed from him. He's been pretty successful with the Phantom so far. Again, the guy's got all of the tools uh, to be a top, um, to be a defensive defenseman. We don't know how good he's going to be, but we do know the organization is very high on him. They He has been brought up several times uh, by different people as being somebody the Flyers are taking very seriously. I wouldn't jump to him being in the NHL next year. I'm sure they will give him a long look. Um, But uh, it is important that he's here with the Phantoms and theoretically will get playoff time. Looks like the Phantoms probably will make the playoffs. Um, And he just seems like the, you know, type of mammoth size with all that stuff that maybe he can be a good bottom pairing defenseman at the NHL level. I don't think it's a game changing move. Um, but I do think it's good that they brought in the EL, uh, they brought him in with the ELC, get him uh, locked up and with the Phantoms because we might be losing Adam Yinning at the end of the year, too. So we're not sure about that one yet. Um, Vasily, you want to give your thoughts? Yeah, sure. I think for McDonald, 
he's a sixth round pick, 165th overall in the 2022 draft. Anytime a sixth round pick uh, looks like you know they can be potentially an NHL player for you, even on a bottom pair, I think that's a win, right? How many teams select guys in the in the sixth round in the draft that make it to the NHL? It's typically not a high chance. Um, so I think when you look at it, look at it like that, um, it's a win for the Flyers, and I think. His skill set, in a sense, um, it might be something, not to say he's like a Nick Sealer replacement, but he's similar to Nick Sealer. And I wonder he if if he's almost like a like Sealer being re-signed here is almost a bridge to McDonald in the sense where they let McDonald really cook in the AHL for a year or two, kind of get his experience, and then he might come in on the, on the bottom pair. But to your point, I'd expect he'd probably play majority of next season in the AHL unless yeah. he really blows everybody away here. Sure. Um, yeah. Jamie? Oh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I just got a different perspective. I think they are trying to groom him to be what Samuel Moran was. Sure. Or, yeah. Or would have been, given his size. Uh, but, like, to, to both of you, uh, he's actually a pretty solid skating defenseman, which uh, is very surprising given his size. His weight, I mean. He, not only is he, what, 6'3", 6'4", but he weighs what two hundred fifty pounds or something in that. No, age? I don't. I don't think so. Does or he? I thought is it two. It might be two. I think he's two twenty. But yeah, I'll check. 220, yeah, 220 at six four though. But for a kid, that's really big, Jamie. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, he's only twenty one. So like, man, that that, that I, he's got some size. So he's gonna be hard to move off the puck for sure. Yeah, exactly. And uh, his gap control is far better than. What what it, it should be given his size? So yeah, there's no reason why the Flyers wouldn't be high on this young man. Had a really good season for Northeastern. Uh, he was on the radar and he he made the most of, made the most of it. But uh, like you Reef said, I mean he's really playing well for the Phantoms. So it's very surprising. The only thing uh, I think they've reasoned uh, they went with the uh, PTO Eurif was because they did it similar style to Mil Andre. Uh, the year prior, and I think that that was so they didn't burn a year uh, of his e- ELC. Oh yeah, that's a great point, Jamie. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, that is a great point. And just a quick uh, update on his stats: he's got two assists, and he's a plus five with ten penalty yeah. minutes in nine games. So it's a good start for defense. Five is, is pretty remarkable, a, especially in a high-scoring league like the AHL. Well, considering uh, majority of the team is in the minus, uh, yeah, no, that's what I mean. The AHL, man, the AHL, they can score with the best of them. And that that's what I was – so I wanted to go back to one of the points. Be careful with Kolesov and, and stuff in that nature and not looking at his AHL stats. The only reason I say it's because it is a high-scoring league. So it, it, it sometimes it doesn't tell the whole story. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. He's only been a minus in one game. Uh, he's either been even, he had a plus four game and two plus one games, um, which again, plus minus doesn't tell the whole story, but the fact that he's not out there, um, you know, giving up goals yeah. as, you know, as just a, as coming a rookie, over. Yeah. A crucial stretch, right? Like yeah. all these teams in, in the AHL are fighting for playoff spots. So oh, yeah. the fact that he can kind of adjust on the fly like that coming in from a whole different yeah. league, uh, that, I mean, that's a, that's a great sign, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, I so, like the sign. Yeah, no, I really like it too. I'm I'm really interested to see him. Uh, he'll he'll get a long look at pre and during preseason. I imagine. I think Tortorella is going to like him. So, because uh, they're definitely talking him up, right? Uh, if they're yeah. bringing him up, that means Tortorella is aware of this guy already, and uh, they'll they'll be giving him a look. I don't think he's going to make the team, but they'll be giving giving him a look for sure um, in preseason and give him a lot of PK time and just try to wear him down as they do in preseason. You really want to. You want to test the guy's mental fortitude and um, his physical nature. Um, and if he stands up to that, he will be potentially even a call up. Um, and let's not forget, like Emil Andre is very much in the mix for next season. So yeah, definitely. Um, I know everybody forgets about that, but the idea was to keep him and let him marinate. Um, so, you know, I don't think they're going to be necessarily jumping to replace Emil Andre's opportunity uh, to be in the NHL next year because they thought that was going to be the case this year. And uh, he's learned a lot down there. So um, so the next signing, and so I guess this is just the overall story here. So Denver ended up beating Boston College in the Frozen Four Finals. Uh, Cutter Gauthier's team was 
unsuccessful. Uh, they did come in with a lot of big names. They were shut down by Massimo, uh, Massimo Rizzo's team, uh, the Flyers prospect. Uh, both of w- those players did not have an ELC. Um, Cutter Gauthier and Rizzo. Now both of them have an ELC. Cutter Gauthier uh, officially signed his ELC. He will be playing a game with Anaheim, I believe. They have a game on the, not today, but tomorrow. Um, when this episode, uh, most of you will be listening to it. I think he'll be playing his first game. It's my guess. Um, I know he's with the team now, but more importantly, he's gone now. And more importantly, Massimo Rizzo has signed his ELC. I don't know if he's going to come over to play for the Phantoms immediately. Uh, I imagine that they probably would like to get him in here to the playoffs for the Phantoms. This is a guy we don't know too much about his actual NHL upside. I'm hearing third line player. I'm hearing he needs to work on his two way game. I'm not entirely sure. I didn't watch this guy a lot, but he was very successful at the college level. Um, It actually kind of reminds me of like Jay O'Brien. He seems to be like that caliber of guy. Jay O'Brien is not playing from what I've seen right now. Um, So I don't know what that means for Rizzo. Uh, He could be like that type of guy where he could disappear into the wind and you never really hear from him again. And he could be one of those kind of, oh, this was a really nice pickup by the Flyers at the end of the day. Um, I think we'll have to kind of wait and see, but he's another guy that will probably get a long look in preseason to really test him, but will ultimately be playing for the Phantoms. Yeah. Well, I think uh, Rizzo Rizzo is going to get an extended look just because of the position he plays because he plays the center position. True. So I think, uh, you know, I think they're hoping that, again, to be like what they thought Tanner Lazinski was going to be because Tanner Lazinski is a free agent. Uh, at well, obviously at the conclusion of the uh, AHL season, if I'm not yep. mistaken. Yep. So I think that they may not elect to resign him, so they're going to have to replace Tanner. One one thing that they were hoping, I think, was that Tanner would grab the uh, grab the reins by the bullhorn and be a third or fourth line center. You know what I mean? Especially since given the lack of center depth. But then, in one hand, I could ad- honestly see them resigning Tanner just in case, just to have that center depth. So uh, it's going to be kind of interesting there, but I think that they're hoping that uh, Rizzo is what they thought Tanner Lazinski was going to be. And um, and to allude, I think they've rushed the signing. Uh, Yurif, uh, you were correct. I think it is to get games with the Phantoms. I don't think, because they could have held off. He he, he still had, he, he was only a junior. So it's not like they had to sign him today. But I think that they uh, they wanted to get you know him uh, his taste of playoff experience. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, I think the signing makes sense based on his age. Since he's 22 years old, um, the ELC is actually only a two year contract, not a typical three year deal. Um, but yeah, it's it's a typical cap hit. Like you're 925 thousand. Um, the base salary is 832 thousand. Then he gets 92 thousand dollars of uh, signing bonuses. Um, but I expect at least for Rizzo, like next season will probably be a full AHL season for him unless he comes in somehow and lights the world on fire. Um, at least for him, I think, I think obviously the, like he, he puts up a ton of numbers, um, at U of Denver in the, in the NCHC, like gets 36 points, uh, in 39 games in his, uh, freshman season, 46 points in, uh, 38 games in his sophomore season, and then 44 points in 30 games this year as a junior. I mean, the scoring is really great. Um, but you have to remember, right. He's a lot older than a lot of the other players. Uh, he's also a seventh round pick. So, not to say that he can't be an impact guy for the Flyers, but I think you got to be a little bit tempered as to what he can be. But I think what you mentioned, Jamie, just being a Lazinski replacement, um, that I think is definitely where they're going to place him next season because you look at the Phantoms and you look at their center depth, um, they're probably going to need a guy like him uh, with Lazinski probably being on the move. And who knows about Elliot Desnoyers even knocking on the door for the Flyers, right? So there might even be um, less depth for the Phantoms. So I think for Rizzo, probably an AHL season and then kind of see where it goes, right? And see how he produces. Yeah. Desnoyers needs to rebound as well. He needs to have a yeah. strong playoff. And I'm going to be honest, he, it shocked me, man. The destroyer. I can't, like, wow. Yeah, he really took a step back this year. But it, look, it happens. Development is not yeah. an up, upward yeah, exactly. trajectory not, usually. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it doesn't come with a uh, sheet. Hey, this is what I'm going to be. You know, you have to go out and actually yeah. 
Yeah, I th- still a super that, young guy, twenty two. So. I I I'll be honest. I don't see Rizzo getting an opportunity in the NHL next year. The only player that I see, and again, we could be completely wrong because it's super early and we're not even watching dev camp or preseason or anything like that. But I think Tuomala is the guy, and we talked about this a bunch. Yeah, I'll uh, agree with that. Just how much Tortorella liked him. Um, I really the believe long look he, he got right yeah. to start this season exactly, and yeah. just how he performed it makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Um. So I do have the I have one topic before this, but I'm just gonna switch, and I'm we'll just talk about the Phantoms now. Um. Okay. So the Phantoms did actually uh get some help. Uh, the Flyers sent down four players here today. Um, as we're recording this, Bobby Brink, Adam Yinning, Ronnie Adderd, and Ule Lixell will all be sent down to the Phantoms for this playoff run. I'm a little surprised that Tyson Forrester is not part of that group, just given his age. Um, but I guess they feel he doesn't need it, which I agree he doesn't need it, but I want to see the Phantoms win. And if he had a guy like Forrester, it's like, okay, that he'd probably be the best player in the league. Um, but you know, Bobby Brink is obviously going to be tremendously helpful to that team. They have not been playing amazing, um, this year. They've definitely, you know, I, I, you know, I've talked about Rocky Thompson. I definitely talk about Lappy here because I don't, you just on a very artificial surface level, you know, I'm not happy with the team's performance, um, being so low in the standings with the amount of talent they have. They did have injuries this year, but still, but adding these four guys should be a humongous boost to them. Um, some other teams will be adding other, you know, prospect players and whatnot. I'm sure there's going to be other send down. So they're not going to be the only team doing this. Um, but considering Bobby Brink probably has potential to be like a leading point scorer in the AHL, and we already know Lixell was one of them. Uh, and then you add Yinning and Adder, you know, after their time in the NHL, it could really boost the Phantoms. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. I think that gives you a little bit extra to follow the Phantoms now. Um, I'll definitely be trying to watch those games with the Phantoms, uh, assuming that they make the playoffs. Um, what do you guys think? Uh, Vasily, you can go first on this one. Yeah, I think for the Phantoms, adding those guys is going to be huge. Like, think about how... Um, impactful Ole Lickshell was uh, for the fans this season. Uh, obviously one of their leading scorers and they lost him for a considerable amount of time, right? And still uh, managed to stay afloat here in this playoff race. Same with Bobby Brink when he was down there, obviously not for a long time, one of their leading scorers. Um, and I think to be honest, probably the most impactful will be Yinning and Adder getting sent back down because they were a pairing for the Phantoms all season and were one of their most stable pairings this year. Um, so to lose a full pairing like that uh, as a team in the midst of a playoff race, I mean, we saw what happened to the Flyers when they lost Sealer and Walker, right? It's like a similar thing for the Phantoms. Uh, you lose one of your best pairings in, in Adder and Yinning. I think getting those guys back will even help stabilize them further. So I, I think you just have to hope they, they get into the playoffs and then from there, um, you know, see what they can do. But there's a lot of young guys on that team. The Phantoms are really young. So the deeper they go, the better it is for their experience, right? Even though it's AHL playoffs, it is still playoffs and uh, it is still really important for development. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Actually, the uh, I'm going to circle back to Ronnie Adder. Actually, that one surprised me a little bit, that uh, recall. I actually thought uh, Belpedio was uh, going to get the uh, call there because uh, they were pretty high on Belpedio, and uh, he was one I, of the last. Cuts I was so confused when he didn't get called up. He played so yeah, well with I, I the was Flyers. Too. Uh, I, I, I just was, think it's the young player thing, right? Like, you bring Adder up because he's a younger yeah. guy. I guess. I guess, that, uh, I guess that's why it made sense. But when he was with the club for X amount of games earlier in the season, he'd seen the jive with the locker room and Definitely. it seemed like uh, they, they were pretty happy to have him on the ice. So yeah, I'm actually really surprised that Adder got that call. Cause I thought that they would have wanted him down there for, they didn't want to mess up the ebbs and flows of, of a uh, young players season since they already recalled Adam Jennings. So I, uh, yeah, I was actually surprised that Bill Pedio didn't get the, get the call, especially to help with the uh, playoff run, you know, with missing Nick Sewer and Jamie Drysdale, two players that had, you know, experience, uh, Jamie, much less experience, but, you know, Nick Sealer with tons of experience when they were on the shelf and Ross Smith's first alignment was on the shelf, but, uh, it is what it is. Can't really go back in the time, but yeah, the, uh, the Phantoms definitely get the boost with those four said players. Uh, you you, you bring up a good point as well about Tyson Forrester. I was actually, uh, kind of surprised. I didn't see his name on the list either. The only thing I could think is maybe he's, it, although he didn't really say much about this at his uh, 
exit interviews. I wonder if he has that nagging injury. Uh, his play, you awesome. know, his uh, I, I, he t- towards the last, you know, six or seven, you know, games of the season, it was like a little bit up and down, not in terms of like his two way game, but his offensive prowess, uh, like went. I don't know. I I know he had a few goals, what against Chicago? Didn't he score? Uh, yeah, you know, that game against Chicago. Yep. And uh, he chipped in, I think, with two more. But um, just the ebbs and flows of the season, I thought that they would have sent him back to keep him going. But yeah, I mean, Hard. I think it. I think they kept to the. Oh, I'm sorry to cut you off, Jamie. I, I think they kept to the four guys that went down are all guys who played for the Phantoms this year, which makes sense. That's a great point. Yeah. Like they also didn't send Guriana up down, who was an AHL player all year, um, or majority of the year. Uh, yeah. Jamie, Jamie Drysdale, who's injured, obviously they wouldn't send him down, but he's also kind of in that age bracket um, where, the, you know, in the past they sent down Cam York at the same age. So yeah, yeah. I, it looked like they just went with like, hey, these guys played for the Phantoms this year. We're going to, you know, give them back. Yeah. Kind of attitude. Did they paper him? I, I forgot. Uh, did they paper him at the trade deadline? I, I don't Who? Uh, Tyson Forrester. No, they did not. Yeah. No, so there, well, there you go. Yeah, there you go. So there, there's your answer. I there's your answer. Can't, can't send him down, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, yeah. So I think that's interesting. We'll be following the Phantoms as we move forward here. So we'll do that. So let's end with a little bit of draft talk. So the Flyers right now, they are sitting in the twelfth pick in the draft for their first round pick. The Florida pick, the second pick, is slated at 27th, but that could change depending, one, if they fall in the standings, which I don't think they really will at this point, um, or if they're out early. Um, We should hope for them to be out early. I don't anticipate it, but if they do, that definitely helps our draft pick, and it moves that up significantly. Um, But what I'm seeing on Tankathon right now the options that fall on, you know, that number 12 spot, I would take this with a humongous grain of salt because I don't think any of these are really accurate at this point. But uh, T. Jaginla, Consta Hellenius, Liam Greentree, and Anton, Anton Salaev. I do not think that these picks um, will be falling in the, the order that they're listed here. Um, they're rarely accurate, especially at this point. The ones like right before the draft tend to be relatively accurate, especially if they come with from like Bob McKenzie because he's mm-hmm. just surveying teams. Um, so he's pretty much telling you who they're going to pick <laughs> before they're picking. Um, but these would probably be, not be accurate. But I think everybody would be thrilled if we got a Ginla's son um, potentially. But I, I think anybody of this crop in the top 15 is going to be great. So the Flyers will still have a chance at the lottery pick. Um, We'll see how that plays out. I was telling Vasily before this, you know, like, and I've definitely mentioned it all before here, but you look at the way things kind of fell here at the end, the, uh, the, the fact that they did all the right things to, by the hockey gods. You know, I talk about the hockey gods all the time. The Flyers did not give up the previous season. People were really upset that they didn't finish bottom three and didn't get a chance at one of the top players in the draft. They ended up getting the second best, second most talented player in the draft. And by the, the post draft D1 numbers, you know, Mitch Cobb would be an NHL player today and probably be outperforming Fantilli. Uh, and Carlson at the NHL level, and he's on a generational pace right now. A, 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 a at the very least, he looks like another Kucherov by the pace that he's on right now. So they ended up getting rewarded for that anyway with an elite talent, um, a highly elite talent at number seven. So in my head, I'm like, either they're going to get rewarded with the right type of player at twelve, or they're gonna uh, they're gonna move up in the draft. And I think like the hockey gods are working at it again. It just felt like one of those things where it was like, even if they won that game against Washington, they would have been out anyway, just because I I think Detroit won that game, at, you know, went to overtime, so that cut them out anyway. And then um, I don't bet against generational players and the fact that Sidney Crosby had to win one game to make it in the playoffs. Like, I expect them to beat the Islanders tonight, even though the Islanders have played well. Um, yeah. I just three, three right now. So OK, there you there you go. Um <laughs> You know, I don't bet against Crosby, so I think there's a good chance the Flyers would have missed the playoffs anyway. And I think by allowing them to not get any points out of that Washington game, a game where 
arguably they should have won. Like we had a goal removed from us and we gave up uh, an empty net goal pulling the goalie during regulation when the game is tied. Like that's such a weird loss. You know, it doesn't even really feel like a loss um, that they ended up staying in the 12th spot in the draft, which they probably shouldn't be either. They probably should have been closer to 15, 16, or 16 yeah. yeah, or even 17 um, where they really could have fallen in that range. And the fact that they are 12, I feel like that'll play out uh, well for us. Um, Jamie, I'll let you go first on this one. Um, what are your man, thoughts about the draft and everything I'm saying? Man, I, I tell you, I'm very excited for the draft because it's going to be kind of interesting. It's very rare that a team moves up to within the top 10, but if they like their guy, you know, and they have plenty of draft capital. Remember, two picks in the first round, you know, uh, that, that could entice maybe a team to – you know, maybe, hey, let me take a step back, you know, like the Flyers, you know, took a step back, you know, for Cam York and accumulated more assets that way. Um, I, I love Tidge again. Uh, if he's there at uh, 12 or whatever, I hope Danny Breyer selects him. But there's a name that – there's a name that not many are really talking about in terms of the 29th pick that the Flyers still hold that. Sam O'Reilly from uh, the London Knights. Man, uh, they know the London Knight program very well. And this kid, I mean, is absolutely top-notch. I think that he's a good power forward. I think he's a sturdy power forward. And one that, obviously, the Flyers know from watching, you know, Oliver Bonk and Denver Parkey and paying attention. The Flyers are very familiar with London, so I, I would have to surmise that Sam O'Reilly is definitely on the radar if he falls to 29. Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good bet. And if they were to somehow move up, even a guy like Sam Dickinson, who also plays for London, like these are guys that the Flyers have been looking at all year. Yeah. Um, clearly, at a bunch of their games, following Barkey and Oliver yeah. Bonk. So, yeah. I think that that makes sense. Yeah, so. no, some some great points, guys. I think for the draft, I mean, obviously, if you're a Flyers fan, you're going to be uh, rooting for some teams to lose. Um, essentially, if you you want a couple things to happen here, right? So for the Flyers to get the most optimal uh, draft choices, mainly with the Florida pick here, um, you'd want the Vancouver Canucks to win the final game of the season, actually. Uh, and that means if the Canucks win the final game of the season, the, the Panthers are actually the lowest ranked division winner out of all the teams. So even though they've won the division, uh, they'll be the lowest ranked. So the pick will be a little bit um, lower. Uh, versus higher uh, and then if the pan the panthers lose before the conference finals the rangers stars and canucks also lose before the conference finals then the flyers pick ends up being 25th overall um, obviously a lot of losing to happen to a lot of good teams so there's not you know there's not a good chance it might happen but the playoffs are crazy so you really never know what will occur um uh, but if you're a flyers fan you want to definitely see the panthers lose a lot the rangers lose a lot which i'm sure flyers fans already want to see and uh the stars and and canucks uh, lose a lot as well uh but yeah i mean that that florida pick's going to be probably anywhere between 25 and maybe 32 it depends i wouldn't be surprised to see the panthers go all the way again they got a really great team um but when when you look at number 12 where the flyers are sitting right now i mean I would say moving up could be a big possibility, right? You got four number one draft picks over the next two drafts. I don't think he's going to like Briere and the staff are going to make all those picks. To be honest, usually when you see a team with that much draft capital, you see some sort of trade made with some yep. of the picks, whether it be to move up in the draft or maybe a draft pick included in another deal to add, you know, an NHL roster player, right? Who knows? Uh, in terms of guys that I think the flyers are going to be looking at in that range, if, if they don't move up in the lottery or don't, trade up Tija Ginla definitely one of them very similar play style to his father which is no surprise um Consta Hellenius um played really really well this season uh in the Finnish league and also I mean is a centerman too and that's uh you know a position that the Flyers desperately need some oh, help yeah. in uh and another one that's a little bit off the board but somebody that Steve's mentioned and he thinks that should probably be between 15 and 10 range uh, based on what he said on the podcast is Sasha boy who plays for uh, Muskegon. And he's had a really, really good season this year um, in the USHL, I believe. So there'll, there'll be some players that the flyers can definitely get uh, that I think will have an impact. Um, the one thing I think, 
and the caveat for Aginla, because I see his name getting tossed around a lot, is the Flames are set to pick a ninth right now. I think if Aginla's around uh, and the Flames have the chance to pick him, they're probably going to be picking that's a, uh, that's him. So very smart prediction. Yeah, yeah, just you ought to think about the family ties and how crazy the Calgary fan base is going to go if you pick Jerome McGinley's son, right? Yeah, spot, and he's legit, so. and he's a legitimate top ten player, so he's not. Exactly. It's not like they're reaching. I, I've no. seen him as high as five. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I I'll be honest though, I really don't trust the rankings uh, this year. It doesn't seem like there is a clear cut outside of Celebrini. Maybe I guess you could say the top three. There really does not seem to be even Saleev is surprising. Like I'm seeing him fall a ton, and like right. earlier this season he was like a bona fide number two. Right. Like I if somehow he's gonna, around, that's one you have to take. I, I think, think uh, six, you know teams might be scared of uh, selecting Ivan Demidov, and if, right. that's, he's, the, if right. that's the case, and he falls to let's just say he falls to seven. Does Danny Briere go straight up? Yeah. yeah. I you mean. I, I'll be honest with the fact that Mitchkov fell to seven and Mitchkov is a superior prospect, even though Demidov is not far behind. I'm not diminishing his uh, impact, but, you know, he's not playing in the KHL this year. You know, he's not doing what uh, Mitchkov is doing. You know, there could be a crazy chance that he is available at 12. And yeah. the question is, do the Flyers go with two Russian top picks and get Absolutely. risky like that? Absolutely. I think I think considerable considering the talent, I think they'd have to. Um, but and the fact they're in the same ska program, I think probably is a ska would hate us. Is huh? an even better yeah. thing for <laughs> yeah, definitely. But I think even a better thing for the development because you look if if you're the Flyers and for some reason he does fall right due to the Russian factor teams, right. whether whether they you know don't want to wait the three years or they're afraid of something, who knows what it may be, but. If he were to fall and you did select him and you have, you know, your two top prospects playing with each other, developing together, developing that chemistry oh together, God. potentially in Russia, <laughs> in a professional league like that's at the same time on the at the same, same time. time. Yeah, that's a, that's like a <laughs> uh, match made in heaven if you're the Flyers and the management staff. So maybe if they have the opportunity, who knows? Right. That would be wild. Definitely. Absolutely wild. I don't look. I think it's unlikely. Um, but it would absolutely be wild. I have a feeling that the Flyers will pick the best player available, whether it's a defenseman or a forward. Um, yeah. I think that's the wisest move every time is you go with the guy with the highest ceiling yeah. um, and go with a guy that you can and, project to be a top player. And I think it's been a trend for the past few drafts, right? Even going back to the Cutter Gauthier draft that the Flyers, their scouts, Brent Flair, they will go best player available. It doesn't really matter what the position and, is or if there is a need for another position. So Yeah, and they've done a great job. I mean, I guess the argument against that was the Cam York pickup where they clearly went for positional need and yeah. avoided grabbing a, a premier goal-scoring prospect. Um, having well, said that, Cam yeah. York is pretty damn good. I mean, he's already yeah, playing a I top mean, pair. He might be having more of an he impact on the his critics. Yeah, yeah. Like we, and I said this at the time when he got drafted, and people don't—they never want to hear this stuff. But like, <laughs> just because Cole Caulfield came in and he's a great player, he's a great young player, he's a goal scorer. But you might be looking five, ten years down the line and being like, "Oh, Cam York is actually the bigger impact on." Yeah, his team. well, that's exactly. what I was gonna say. Or even what player actually has more impact on a night to night basis on the on the game and on the outcomes, right? And, so. and I, I, from what I saw this year from York. My thought that he was going to be a top pairing guy, I, I'm and people might not agree with this at all. I think a number one, a true number one defenseman is absolutely possible. Well, he's only 23 he, and he played this yep. way, so right. And he already jumped into that role, he scored double digits and points. Like, just because a guy didn't come in and score 50, 60 points at 23 years old as a defenseman does not mean he can't be a legitimate number one. I no, mean, yeah. Yossi didn't do that. There's a progression, right? Like, he got 10 goals this season, 30 points, taking off, taking on all the top defensive matchups, right, against top lines as a 23-year-old, real encouraging. To think that he can't, you know, from 23 to, let's say, 26, 27, three, four years, add 20 more points as, let's say, this power play maybe gets a little bit better. Totally possible. Uh, so I think, yeah, like right now, bona fide top pair. Can he get to that number one level? Who knows? But I think it's it's, it's possible. definitely in the cards. Yeah, it's in the cards. It's absolutely possible. I don't know if it's the most likely, 
But like there was always the debate with Kimo Timonen, right? Is he a number one defenseman? In retrospect, he he was. He yeah. wasn't one of the best defensemen in the league. Like he wasn't top five, top ten, but he played against the best players in the opposition and kicked ass. It took it literally took bringing in a generational defenseman in Chris Pronger to knock him down a peg, and then we call him a number two. But it's like there are there are what two Chris Prongers in the league at a time. You know, like there, there, there are five. There are five must-have defensemen in the NHL. There really is not like more than that. There, there isn't like like Victor Hedman. You know them by name. You know, like w- Drew Doughty was able to hold it for like a couple years. But it's not really normal to have like Nichols Lidstrom, who's the best defenseman in the oh, league yeah. every year. Like that's. That's an outlier. That's a general. I think Lidstrom is the best defenseman in NHL history. That's my opinion. I guess you could say no, uh, Bobby Orr, but I, I think Nicholas Lidstrom, I mean, you saw that as soon as he left Detroit, the team collapsed. Um, so we're not saying he's going to reach that level, but it, can he be a legitimate number one guy in the Adam Fox realm, who also was not projected to be a number one defenseman? You know, the John Carlson realm, who also was not projected to be a number Duncan one defenseman. Keith, yeah. Right. I think he can, from what I've seen, he potentially could hit that level. And um, that would be huge. And if you include him and Drysdale in there, and if they do end up getting a guy like Salayev in here, you know, that would look pretty good. I don't think it'd be that crazy for the Flyers to draft a defenseman high. The, Steve has told us that this draft is defenseman heavy. And if the best player available is a defenseman, and the, the Flyers have it, said... Yeah. They are building from the back end out. So just because they need a number one center, if he's not available and that's not the best player pick, to pick at that time, you go with the best player and you take that top defender and you build from the back end out, which will allow your forwards to be more successful without a doubt. We watched the New Jersey Devils win multiple cups doing that without a number one center, but an elite defensive core and an elite goaltender, which I don't know if Sam Erson's elite, but Carter Hart was. And, uh, you know, hopefully Sam Harrison or Kolosov uh, can be that guy. Yeah, he was, yeah. He's another whatever. level. <laughs> ten, 10 shutouts a season, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> Played like 75 games a season, too. Yeah, yeah oh, insane. Shutouts came to the far. Yeah, yeah, they were probably all against us. <laughs> you know, four <laughs> year against the Flyers. And I hate I hate playing him. against Brodeur. I respect him. I like him. But I hated playing. I could not wait for that guy to retire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I don't really want to dig into prospects, but just so everybody's knowing that their the playoffs are going. Denver Barkey is having a phenomenal playoff so far. Oliver Bonk is having himself a good playoff. It looks like they're a team geared up to go to the finals. We'll see how they do there. I imagine they'll probably win the OHL championship they're, and get back to the Memorial Cup. Like they lost the Memorial Cup last season. So they're they're pretty motivated, I think, to get back to that point. That would be cool to watch them on that stage. And uh, I'm, I'm just really excited. I, like, look, let's be honest. Outside of outside of uh, Mitchkov, they are by far the most exciting prospects we have right now. Yeah, that's, definitely. That's where I don't completely agree with what you're saying, Vasily, about trading those assets. I think the Flyers are going to look to be like, over these next two years, load it up. Like, like make sure that prospect pool is deep. And yeah. that you have four first-round picks added in there. I could definitely see that. I, I just think it depends on who becomes available sure. like with the cap, with the yes. cap going up and just with all of that, there's going to be some guys that teams probably thought, Hey, we can never move this guy, but now that the cap's going up, let's move him and let's try to do something else with the roster. So who knows? Yeah. Right? Um, and it's also, it's important to, to, I saw a lot of people talking about how this is a weak draft. So like, it doesn't matter. The 2017 draft was a weak draft. And how many generational players yeah, came out of that? Look at McCarr and Heiskanen and Patterson and, and Robertson, who was a yeah. second round pick. Exactly. Like, uh, that's what you're looking for. There are elite players in this draft. You have two opportunities to grab a guy in the top 30. If you can get one guy who's a top tier player in the NHL, an all star caliber player, it's a home run of a draft. That's yeah, what definitely. this team needs. You got to walk away with one home run player. That's what's Good. important. Good point. All right, guys, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, Jamie, anything you want to add uh, as we close out? No, nah, you know what? I just want to say thank you, Flyer fans. Uh, appreciate all your support, not just for myself, but for the entire team uh, of uh, Flyers Nitty Gritty. But uh, 
I give kudos to you all. Um, you know, uh, you guys were phenomenal all year, not just supporting us, but for the supporting the team and understanding on where they were. And, uh, you know, you guys were great. Uh, it was great. Uh, you definitely deserved that salute by the team yesterday. So uh, hats off to you all. I totally agree. And thank you, Jamie. You do you do a fantastic job. We would not be here without you, man. Um, uh, yes, you wouldn't. You'd be even more thriving. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> Wouldn't even have a name without you. Exactly. Gotta look at yeah. it that way. Um, Vasily, anything you want to add? Yeah, I just want to say thanks to all the Flyers fans for following along. Not only myself and the coverage this season, but Yareev, Jamie, and really any everybody uh, writing for Flyers Gritty Gritty, and everybody contributing uh, to this to the website. And like Jamie said, you could really tell this season with the way the Flyers perform, it really revitalized the fan base. And I think uh, there's going to be even more excitement for next season and and into the offseason moving forward. And uh, just a reminder to you know all the fans who listen to the podcast, and just really anybody who listens, uh, we do not stop. So we're going to continue to record throughout the summer every single week. Uh, even if when there's not a lot of news, we'll be here uh, doing our, you know, deep dives on the roster and cap friendly breakdowns and stuff like that. So if you want hockey talk, we're going to be here all summer. Um, we're the only Flyers podcast that goes the whole season. Uh, and then also just to to continue to keep an eye on Flyers Nitty Gritty dot uh, com as well. There's going to be a ton of articles coming up um, and just a ton of draft content, too, as we gear up. So it's going to be a fun time this summer. Yeah, yeah, I I have a feeling that this will not be a quiet off season for Definitely. us, um, and we'll have plenty to talk about. If it is, I will be shocked. Um, but I I have a feeling that that Danny Breer is going to pull a bunch of magic this off season, and their the excitement going into next season is going to probably be the highest we have seen in a long, long time. Uh, and if they by any chance manage to get Mitchkov out of Russia, forget about it. I don't think it's going to happen this year. I think ne- I've said it over and over again. Next year, I mean, but I can only imagine oh, the man. hype that they're. Just probably, think about the jerseys they're going to sell. Oh my god! Can you imagine what Dev Camp would look season like? Tickets, season tickets would sell out in ten minutes. I yeah. I agree with you. I think he's that big of a name, um, and that's why I think they'll wait one more year till they think that they're ready uh, you know to try let's to get him out of there. Make the playoffs. Let's get on a good run. Let's make the Eastern Conference Finals, and let's add one of the best players, uh, man. And since Eric Lindros has played, holy smokes. Yeah, dude. I, I can't wait to watch him <laughs> next season in the KHL and just watch him, oh, like, what man. he does there. Um, especially if he plays on a good team, if he actually plays on Ska next he, year. And he, he plays will, with sure. the, Right, and he'll play with Demidov. Um, like, that's going to be – they're probably going to be a line, I assume, a probably team. in the top he's six. be a team here, too. Unless Rottenberg uh, continues to do what he's doing, um, which, look, that's possible, too. That guy is a is a tricky bastard. We're gonna bring Rottenberg over to coach the power play. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah. He's gonna destroy our locker room. Oh um, man, Miskoff would never come over. Yeah, no, dude, you're probably not wrong. All right, uh, let's sign off here. Just want to remind everybody: please like, subscribe, share our stuff out if you can. It's a humongous, humongous help to us. Hit the notification bell for notifications. Go to Spotify and iTunes and give us a rating there. Again, tremendously helpful. All of that stuff. If you're not subscribed already, please subscribe to the podcast. Um, again, this is just the best way to support the podcast is just follow us. Um, be aware of us. Get our Help get our numbers up. Um, that's really what, all we're asking of anybody, and that um, is all we really can ask. So, But thank you all so much. And again, a shout-out to our sponsor, Jim Stakes of 4th and South. A reminder, they'll be open on May 1st. Uh, and Public Summit Adjusters, 215-752-0560. Uh, again, Jamie, thank you for coming on, dude. Um, Vasily, great job calling that out. Um, this was a great episode. We love you all. And remember, always stay 